Yeah, I'm not hearing them. <laughs> oh no. No, I am <laughs> I am still here and welcome to Geek Watch, ladies and gentlemen. A subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. That's right, do not it, it, it we are not in a time loop. It is not still Sunday. We are back because the last one went it went um, way too long because we end, because we end up overdoing it when it came to the structure. So we are back to finish what we started. Much like la much like last time, this is this is class warfare creating a track based class system. We called an audible and we're dealing with Final Fantasy tracks using the and adapting them to the track setup of the Legend system. Without any further ado, ado ado. Let's get into this. So, I'm, I'm famished. I want to do. I want to do all the rest of them. <laughs> Last time we tackled the warrior and the expert classes. Tonight we're going to be tackling the mage and adept classes, as well as tackle the independent tracks. So we'll start with mage, and I think we need to get one thing out of the way since we're going to be dealing with magic, for obvious reasons. Um. I have I have absolutely no desire t to use the Vancian model as it is in Legend. I understand why Legend does. We can't. For one, it would it wouldn't really it wouldn't really fit the setting, and two, um, Final Fantasy has barely used that mo that model in the last twenty years. Yeah, it's not a. I mean, like it has its own model that it established it, once it really in the last it. twenty years. It's never used it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because it, that's yeah. You're thinking of, you're, you keep thinking it's 2010 when it when it is indeed 2021. <laughs> I do that too. Don't feel bad. Just feel old. If you're counting the remakes, I say no because their original times of uh of publish were over thirty years ago. Yeah. 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 So because of that, we w um if I. When it, when if I were to handle it, I would be I would be doing so in a um in a MP system. Um, one que one question though, and may maybe this is one of those things that should be setting specific. Should it should it be that um that peop that people still have to find find scrolls and learn and learn it that way? Um, ugh. that's a good one. No. It really kind of depends on the Final Fantasy you're talking about, you know. They all I, have their own different way of doing stuff. I I've never thought that that system was conducive to the type of semi-focused gameplay that you would want in any RPG. Yes, it does. I agree entirely. I, I well, yes, it hey, does. This is a preferential thing, so. Oh, it's not like it's wrong to not like that. A lot of people don't like it, but I completely disagree. So continue. Well, I'm not saying I like or dislike it. I'm saying it, it doesn't seem to fit the type of gameplay you, you would usually see in most RPGs. I see yes. it in every RPG I run, man. I think you, you go to the dungeon, you get the treasure. <laughs> um, what I'm specifically refer referring to is is whether or not whether or not they have access to spells just by leveling, or whether or not they even even with leveling, they'd still have to go out and get um, scrolls. I think you could probably just do it from leveling to be simpler, honestly. Like, I, I usually stump for go find the magic scroll to learn the magic, because it makes it feel a little more arcane and cool to me. But honestly, like, it, even old school D&D, like, there's some that you just learn automatically due to your own magic research, so I, I would probably just cut the second option if we're going for more streamlined game. Yeah. Plus, well, um, the when it comes when it comes to the whole going out and going out and learning the scrolls, um, honestly, honestly, that's that's something that I've always that I've always had an issue with when you're dealing with a game that has a codified list of spells. Not to mention the fact that almost every game where you bought scrolls for magic in Final Fantasy were just that you bought them from stores. You did not find them. You bought them. Yeah, and that's my that's my reason why I say it's it's not conducive 
to the semi-focused nature of most RPGs, because what that encourages is rush to the next town to get the next best spells, rather than a little bit more exploration, a little bit more delve into some of the side quests, etc. Um, it's one yeah, of the reasons... Really this is one of those questions that is very dependent on how you're setting the world up. You know? Given given the fact, right, it, it, uh, given the fact we're using Final Fantasy as a basis, that's what I'm going off lot, of. There's lots of Final Fantasy worlds. Well, what, I mean, what, what I was material, what I was you know? what I was going to say is that we're, is that um, even though even though we we are using the mytho we are using the mythos of of um, Final Fantasy as a as a blueprint to build around. But I th I feel like the question of, the question of of the, of whether or not they have to buy it whether or not they have to buy it or find scr scrolls in that regard is a setting specific question and so is kind of outside our current purview. Well, and yeah, that, I was also and I think the ultimate goal here is going to be you know a modular enough system that you could slot it into your favorite Final Fantasy verse or make one that was just Final Fantasy themed with your own elements in the setting so yeah, yeah. I, linking it specifically to going and purchasing or finding scrolls that's way too specific mm -hmm. well and and then the you were about to bring up materia as a counter argument i was going to oh, point I mean, out materia that. draw there's so many weird things we are not draw. we are not tackling materia or junction because those deserve their own video entirely if we were to, uh, uh, every additionally sing, every single um t every single trpg entry uh, every, uh, when it comes to Final Fantasy, that I have seen treats mater treats materia as a si as a side system, or goes with the assumption that you're going to have to blow up a lot of the mechanics in order to accommodate materia. The the point I was going to make was that materia, unlike the scrolls and other systems from other Final Fantasies, is a piece of equipment. You can't have those spells unless the materia is equipped. Whereas just buying the scroll gives you the spell list for everybody in your party in the other Final Fantasies. And it yeah, isn't yeah, something I mean, you equip. It's just there, in your inventory. There's a lot of issues with materia. I, I love it in the game of Final Fantasy VII, but it really means that you don't have casters. Like, because everyone has whatever you put on them. Um, you know? Rails, though, I think, at this yeah. point. Now, one other thing that we do that we do need to tackle is the fact that last time we completely skipped over the fighter. Um, now, the fighter for when it comes to the war when it comes to the warrior class is going is going to be a, is going to be a tricky one simply because of the fact that um, in the, in a lot of in a lot of previous cases the fighter was was in the same vein as the. Um, as the as old school D and D fighters, i.e., th their main stick is being able to do more damage with weapons and equip any weapon. Although, as we pointed out in um, reconstructing D and D classes, the whole um, being able to equip any weapon doesn't isn't as much of an isn't as much of an advantage as is often thought when people are go when people are going going to pick one particular kind of weapon, typically sword and board, and stick with it. Largely because there isn't enough of a reason to go with other weapons. Why, as a fighter, should I should I be should I be wielding a knife in a, in a fight? Unless unless there's unless there is a sufficient reason for that. Now, granted, there has been attempts to give sufficient reasons with the with, when you had the inclusion of feats. <laughs> Prompting the prompting Zan's nickname of the third edition fighter, the feeder. 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 Yes. Yeah. I want so this good. page of feet and this page of feet and half that page of feet. Thank you. Yeah. Um, they they really were tryhards in third edition with fighter. And really the advantage of it was never getting to use every weapon. The real advantage was that they being access to armor. Like and that wasn't ubiquitous to fighter. So even, yeah, they, even uh, with even with that, when you can when you consider when you consider that ev that so many other um, archetypes were having in were having entire systems of contribution dedicated to them, mm. um, I think that I think that's one of the things that contributed to fighter being Babby's first class. Yeah, and, and I like there are some systems that really make them sing. Uh, Axe, like you mentioned last time, Axe is a perfect one for it. Where it gives them like it basically almost solely gives them the good version of Cleave, and it's really good. Mm -hmm. It gives them a really hefty hit die, which is really important in that setting. Um, but yeah, not 
a, a lot of versions of D and D. The the fighter gets left well in the dust, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Now, I liked designing a fighter with m monkey grip and improved monkey grip so that he could one-handed wield huge weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are we going to do Final Fantasy VII or not? Because it sounds like Cloud and his Buster Sword, but you're all poo-poo in the materia, sir. No, <laughs> I have I have a different I have a different approach in mind, and it calls back to a game that Zan and I are very familiar with. That being Anima Beyond Fantasy. I had so much fun mocking that. I, I've never actually played it, but I had a lot of fun making fun of the translation. I I, ha I, ha I have um, a lot of a lot of things really clicked once I once I realized that the creators were big fans of Rollmaster. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh... And truth be told, and it with... was written entirely in Spanish at yep. first. And truth be told, I've actively considered considered find, finding a way to do some back adaptation what with the um, what with the release of against the dark master but the anima had 20 they called them classes but for all intents and purposes they were archetypes because it was because what they determined was how easy or difficult i.e. how expensive it was to lear to learn certain skills and abilities the weapon, one of these that I want to focus on is the Weapon Master, which what which was a which was a a essentially a fighter variant, whose big whose big advantage was that they was that they had a much easier time purchasing weapon modules. I.e., they're the kind of people who could, who could get um a, a literal variety of of weapons and we and um weapon modules for for styles and the like since the when it came to weapon modules like and combat modules as a whole that applied to both learning how to utilize weapons as well as learning certain weapon tricks like it like um area attack and it should be it should be noted that there actually is a sufficient reason to want to have multiple weapons in a game like anima for for one, um, different damage types and different ar and different armor types are a are a bigger factor. And two, um, heavy weapons are go are going to affect your initiative. You have to you have to re you have to roll in you have to, you reroll initiative each round. And if you end up if you end up switch if you end up switching some of some of the heavier weapons will incur a initiative penalty. Mm. And I, I actually kind of like that. Um, it, it still harkens back to kind of like the same reason I like the Squire, where it's a lot about versatility and mm -hmm. being able to choose the appropriate thing for the circumstance. Yeah, and um, that that fits. I think that and it makes it makes it seem like you could do uh, this again, kind of as a backup to some of the more sp like specific and and a little more colorful classes. Yeah. So like, and yeah, I, I think that makes it really solid. The the appro. The approach with the f with the fighter in our case is that because of now Legend has a has a tag based set setup when it comes to how it uses weapons. So because so um some some of the whole weapon list thing that that might be used in other games we can't do, but I have an I have an alternative approach. A somebody who has taken the weapon master track is not just go is not just going to have. A melee arranged we or arranged weapon, or, e or even bo or even both, they're going they're going to have mu they're going to have multiple weapons, um, not necessarily using two weapon fighting, but consider consider the consider the kind of walking arsenal that y that you might see in certain action movies or in or in certain um in certain single player entries when it comes to games. This is a knight might have a sword and board. A fighter is going to have a sword and board. Might have a dagger. Might have a cro Might have a crossbow. Might have a. Might have a spear. Might have a great sword. He's the person who go who goes into the who goes into the uh, weapon shop, and the shopkeeper asks, okay, "Okay, which, which one? Which weapon are you looking for?" And he says, "Yes." The key thing. The key thing with him is that. Is that as is um. 
he'll have he'll have he'll ha he'll have a set of he'll have a set of weapons based on a certain num based on a certain number of tags um and with and these fa these favored um tag loadouts he can switch to a lot more easily than other people it doesn't t it i'd say it i'd say at higher tiers he could pro he could probably um when doing multiple attacks he could switch between weapons as a free action Yeah, and like it, this is still a game where you get multiple attacks at a certain uh, level, isn't it? Depends on the game system you're in. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I mean, like it, that would actually be really cool because you could um, you could target different uh, enemies with your different attacks in different ranges or like different. Uh, you could even like because there's all kinds of like situations where you need to hit two guys mm -hmm. <laughs> with two very different kinds of weapons. Like, you got a skeleton here and a zombie here, and, like, it's half damage for bludgeoning in one, half damage for piercing in the other. But you happen to have both weapons, so it's just like, well, that's actually kind of neat. Yeah. And th that's the that's the approach that the, that the, um, fi that the fighter would have. And ob obviously, um, you can you combine that with you combine that with certain other combination style approaches, and you've got and you've got something that's going to be fairly interesting. Since you brought, it's interesting that you brought up cloud in this regard because I'd say the I'd say the better analog would be would be um, Advent Children cloud. <laughs> I was about to say, you mean with the insane fusion sword? Yes, that weapon could never work ever, and I still love it for everything that it is. Welcome to Final Fantasy. Oh, trust me, I'm well aware. Um, is this a bad time to mention that I did u that I did use that thing as a um as a lev as a level N A Diclave in an Exalted game a long time ago? That scans. That, <laughs> that totally that, scans. That's yeah. That <laughs> uh, fusion sword and Exalted. Just another day. Well, I I kind of I kind of made it worse. Um, oh God. So, um. They weren't all. They weren't all made of the same magical material. So it was just like this rainbow of like aura, calcum, and moon silver, and star metal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. Beautiful. Again, that scans because each of the swords is built from a different alloy, according to some of the documents we have seen in our books. Mm -hmm. So. Again, the fusion sword and exalted. Just another day that ends in Y. Um, but with that said, with that said, I think we should. I think we should head. I think we should head for the mage. Now, some some of these are going to be simpler than others. Um, but we'll start at the top with Arcanist. Um, so, are we talking the Arcanist from Bravely then? Yeah, I think I think that I think I think that. Oh, uh, why don't you why don't you give the skinny when when it came to the Arcanist for um, bravely default? So Arcanist is essentially an, an extremely specialized black magic. They're dark. They're based. They're based in dark based abilities. It's dark elemental. They sometimes inflict um, a few status effects such as poison or sleep. But that's all in service of their dark elemental attacks, because poison and sleep allow them to do more damage with a second spell thrown on top of that, or to instant kill people who are asleep. That was a that was a broken ability. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, they it's it's heavily specialized black magic towards just being the darkest of the dark, so dark that even darkness is is too bright for my dark. Um, and you know this culminates in the fact that the character who was the Arcanist Asterisk Colder was a tiny, genetically created monstrosity child who had to continue to go into a test tube to stay alive. Blacker than the blackest <laughs> black times infinity. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, that do does it. sound like a pretty goth story. So I'm, <laughs> I'm down with that. Um, yeah, but if you see the outfit, it's anything but goth. Um, the a perky goth. the uh, the approach the approach that I'm going with is that. Um, Arcanist and several of the other tracks could be best described as spellcasting traditions. Um, they may give they may give us, us they may give some mat, some degree of magical effect, but their spellcasting doesn't directly come from them. Um, I don't get it. 
Well, that's super not goth, you're right. Anyway. Um... I told you. <laughs> and that's just a female outfit. Yeah. The uh, the appro- So the approach that I, that I want to go with in this case is when we... Th- when is that um in some ways i'm think i'm thinking of having the the arcanist to be to be stylistically similar to a war- to a um to the more dangerous end of of magic users the way um the way sorcerers and warlocks are treated especially warlocks in some in um some settings that that makes sense but we're, we're are we still talking about the mechanical influence or is this more like a setting thing um I'm I'm bringing this up to I'm bringing this up to kind of to kind of give with the kind of demonstrate the um, style with them. They are they they would f- first off I th- I do think that they would sp- that um they would specialize in um in being in being able to bu- being able to debuff and bu- and bully those who they've debuffed. I like that actually. I, I would like to to note that the uh, Japanese name of the arcanist is Majin, uh, using specifically the kanji for witch and de- and and or demon and person. Uh, witch yeah, woman. But the the fact is that it's not using the jin as in kami as in god, meaning demon god, which is used very commonly for. A lot of different things in Japan. Mm-hmm. It's most likely that this actually means the greatest witch, or the the person who is the witch, because uh, it's all about cursing your opponent to death. Essentially, mm-hmm. you inflict those debuffs, and then you kill them with them. Yeah, and you know how you know how that you know how there's been a few um, if else type of me- type of mechanics with some of the previous tracks that we've talked about. I'm think I'm thinking of go- I'm thinking of going with going with something like that, but instead of in, in some ways in some ways the arcanist would lean a bit of would lean a bit as the anti general. The general <laughs> has an it has if has if else setups for the allies. The arcanist has if has if else effects on the enemy's actions. If enemy is asleep, cast exterminate and watch them die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm actually kind of in love with this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, like the um, for for example, for example, um, for example, let's let's say let's say that you let's say that you want you want to ha- that a arcanist wants to wants to make sh- wants to screw some wants to screw an, a- an enemy over from using ma- from using magic. Well, if they then you can have the approach that they have that they have the um they have the cur- they have the curse of inversion. So if they so whenever they do whenever they do a casting action or some equivalent um the die that they would ro- that they would roll for the attack is tr- is treated as whatever they rolled naturally minus 20. You're literally flipping the die over. Oof. So it so it would basically make it so that they'd get negative to their roll instead of positive. Um what it essentially if somebody so in this regard if somebody was rolling a 18 they'd roll a 2 instead. Their roll would be treated as a 2. Yeah, so a 20 is a 1 and 19 mm-hmm. is a well, mm-hmm. what would it be a 19 would be a 2 then? Yeah. Okay. Be yeah, eighteen would be a three. It, I, I think you get. I think you get what I'm go, where I'm going with this approach. Yeah. You 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 you're 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 pulling one of the oldest ciphers in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't alter the odds at all, though. Hmm. It doesn't alter the odds at all, though. Because. Like the reason why I'm not the facing is it matters how often you will roll the range of facing. So like, if I roll a one, and that's great for me. That's the exact same odds as rolling a twenty. I'd I'd probably put in I'd probably put in a a um a set. First off, it's it's one of those it's one of those things where it's 
that where um, activating it is something that they have to do. So if they if they if the target ends up rolling like crap, no reason to activate the curse. Um, it's one of those things that you would that would be used specific specifically to mess with a um, a a roll that a roll that was done well. Oh, is it like after the fact? Yeah. Okay, so like they roll super good. They're like, oh, not twenty, and you're like, I got bad news, champ. That yep. is cool. Yeah, but something something that powerful. Would be in like a per encounter power. power. I mean, if it's a, I mean, it's a we, spell, it would be based on true. MP cost, um, right? And it, at that point, we'd give it a higher, higher MP cost. Since mm -hmm. it is mages, we would we would talk about it in terms of MP. Yeah. Um. Whereas know, it, it depends on how we're costing things, because like that's really nasty circumstantially, but it's still like compared to like a fireball, you know, that's like way deadlier on a bigger scale to more mm -hmm. enemies. I don't know. Um. I don't know how expensive that would be. Yeah. The the key, um, you and so a lot a lot of a lot of the things that would be associated with with a with a with a witch or a warlock is the kind of things that would be utilized by an arcanist. Um, some you could another possibility is having a is having a self is having a um self inflicted curse. So if so, so you so target target a single one and say if if they do, if they do damage to me then they take then they take that ex then whatever damage they roll they take it as well. You'll still take the damage, but so will they. Mhm. Mm Turning yourself into a bit of a voodoo doll there. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. great. Uh, that and that fits the way the arcanist feels in a uh, in bravely default. I'll be honest, the the brave the arcanist was not a overused class when it came to bravely default. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, just because something's nifty and and novel doesn't necessarily mean it's useful or fun or interesting. So it was, it was very niche. I only played it long enough to level it up to max, so I could eventually get the best classes. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as um, as far as black mage, um, this is this is pretty this is pretty sim this is pretty simple. It is you you are do you are doing black, you have black magic. Um, you have the traditional elemental spells of Final Fantasy. Yep, that you weave so well. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Now, granted, F. Now, granted, Final Fantasy Fourth Edition has a has a slightly expanded approach when it comes to when it comes to the different. Because they have um, a Rydia, right? She she's the summoner too. Um, uh, Final yeah. Fantasy Four, Final Fantasy Fourth Edition, the tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, I thought we we're talking about Final Fantasy, not Final Fantasy. Yeah. No, yeah. we're talking about Final Fantasy. Get it oh, straight. Nice. Thanks, Dan. That, that cleared everything up beautifully. Yeah. But <laughs> as cr crystal clear as mud. Now I <laughs> I um I did and I did end up making a set, a setup where you have um with when it comes to a lot of the ca when it comes to a lot of the spellbook tracks um I'm going with the I'm going with the idea that they have um five tiers which I had which I had written as um. Novice, intermediate, expert, superior, and ancient. So, uh, for for good question then concerning black magic, if they have ancient tier, say fire magic, would that be flare? Um, I'm a, I I am of two I'm of two minds about whether or not I would have flare count as cosmic magic. Well, the reason I ask is due to the fact that uh, things like uh, flare and tornado and uh, those sorts of uh, spells have been sometimes seen as the pinnacle pinnacle above the level for firaja, blizzaja, fundaja mm -hmm. magic. Although I'm, a, I have half the mind to have that the to have that the ancient tier um, um, fire spell is actually meltdown. You. 
Ew. Inflict mm. defense zero on people, including yourself. Ouch. I said it, I said it was of two minds of it. I didn't say I was going to go with it, but yeah, the the idea of Flair being ancient here is is one I'm one I'm a little more willing to go to um go with. Yeah, no, I get it. Melt meltdown as as the ancient tier fire magic. Then what are we going to have for the <laughs> ancient tier blizzard and thunder magic? Yeah. Um. I do th now when it. When it comes to when it comes to um when it comes when it comes now as the now when it comes to some of the gimmicks that cer that certain black mages have had th have had throughout the series, I'm I'm planning on shifting that to uh, to other um t to other tracks. Like if so, that if so, if you, I mean, if like, you're is like black mage and summoner, so mm -hmm. that'll work. If so, if somebody's taking black. If somebody's taking the black mage track, it is solely to get black magic spells. Now get now some of the some of the other tracks might might make you might make you a little bit more adept with spell casting. But if you just want if you just want a few spells to gish it up, just take that track. <laughs> gish it up, I love that. Um, so so basically, people, if you want to cast Undepugnius, well, you're not going to do it with black mage. <laughs> um, I don't know anybody else who knows that that reference besides you, Monk. <laughs> and I hate it. You don't like the fact that Eight Bit Theater's Black Mage can cast the Hadoken by sucking love out of the world and increasing the divorce rate? <laughs> let Let me just get, get this joke out of the way. Find person. Find person. Date. Um. Detect person. Dating service. Hold person, wedding chapel, remove curse, divorce attorney. <laughs> Moving on, cosmic mage. Um, when it comes to the idea of co of cosmic ma of cosmic magic, um, I the thing that the thing that for whatever reason is coming to mind is celestial wizards from um, Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, yeah, man, same. <laughs> now we, we we rolled the time mage from a from bravely series into this. Yeah, you've got Probably you've wise. you've got a, you've got a fair amount of the. Um, I had I had thought about I had thought about giving cosmic mage spells like um, spells like quake comet and the like, but. Because of the fact that we're that I think the cosmic mage should be doing um, space time manipulation, I opted against doing that. The space and slow and quicken. Mm -hmm. Do they get like gravity? Because that's space manipulation, isn't it? Yeah. Did we we gave we gave cosmic the gravity magic, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Cool. I'm I'm totally on board with this. I honestly that just seems like like exactly the change I would have made in your shoes. So yeah. The, now the question is, did we give it Mateo? Um, um. <laughs> I don't think I don't th I don't think so. My my approach with the cosmic mage is that they is that they are they should be very very good at messing with the terrain and supporting and, mes it. and, mes and messing with the and messing with placement. So the idea of the idea of um oh well, they've got teleport then yeah tell. Um, teleport, teleporting, being able to, being able to teleport, uh, being able to teleport other, other, um, other, indiv other, indiv other targets beside them, beside themselves, being able to, um, being able to delay, to delay the, uh, the effect, of, the effect of damage. So some, so say somebody gets hit, but they don't, act, but they don't actually subtract their hit points until, until a turn later or something like that. You're already or dead. Bleed out of her. Or no, it's it's, that. it's totally you're, it's totally a Hokotono to Ken. <laughs> it's totally a Hokotono <laughs> Ken. Ah, da, 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 da. Although one turn later, you're already dead. Nani? Although in that's so beautiful. In in that in that same regard, you could you you could use that to um to he to heal the, to um let's say let's say you do let's say somebody's inflict afflicted with. 
afflicted with this and they take damage. Um, in the time in the time it takes for them to actually take the damage, you could you could um, you could ca also you could cast. use cure. Yeah, so you you the the cosmic mage could delay the damage. A white mage could cast cure before the next turn comes up. Both effects stack, and then they really did take no damage simply because it was cured before it could hit. Yeah. Um. Oh, that's that's a. Now you're getting into space time fuckery. Um. Could pop you could pop you could um possibly use use that use this kind of, use this kind of thing to um to get to um get to sw to have it that it switches initiative with somebody so let's let's say that their initiative is cr is crap and that and that one that one speedy boy keeps harassing everybody well congratulations you two are now switched on the initiative order fun um and the and the po the i've um I've toyed I've toyed about whether whether or not whether or not magic in this system should be should be fire and forget or whether or not it whether or not charges should um, charge time should have to take should have to um, be a factor. I mean, if you're already like, I don't know. I think it depends. Like, it it does kind of depend. I like, if again, you're already using um. Truth like, be told, uh, truth be told, I was I at one point was considering. Taking the um, taking the spellcasting approach to a certain extent that um, Anima does. With the Zan, you're you're prob you probably remember the whole accumulation setup, where you had to you had to build up the amount of instead of spending Zeon at um, all in one go, you had to you had to build up the amount of Zeon that you were going to use to cast. Yep, I remember. Um, I think I think doing that kind of thing would be would be net, would one give um give it give actual dice give actual dice to roll for the casters given that whole given the would whole nice. one given the whole one dice around that you that you mentioned beforehand and mm -hmm. two and two um give and two give give an actual drawback to the high tier spells instead instead of just now it it can be argued that a that them costing more MP is is a drawback in of itself, but once you get at high once you get at high levels, you're gonna be spamming the, you're gonna be spamming that tier of magic anyways. And the, and especially especially depending on how common um, ethers and the like are, even though we made jokes about sa about saving them. But that's what on a second. They're good to use. You have them recovering consistently during a fight. Mm -hmm. That does a. Like either I get an ether or I do nothing, uh, so I definitely have a preference of between those two systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, now of course would you... definitely suit a more cinematic and climactic feel. Mm -hmm. Um, now hang on a second. Is it older? Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, bit, bit of a, bit of a derp moment from Discord. So next up, monk. There, I'm buddy. still I'm here. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Next up is the necromancer. Again. 
Monk? Yeah, he's definitely, uh, there's definitely delay. And he starts noticing tech issues. Testing, testing, one, two. Welcome All back. All right, we heard you. All right. Sorry about that, folks. Um, bit of a Discord derp. <laughs> um, next up, we have Necromancer. Beautiful. Um, the Necromancer has shown has shown up as a extra class in some in some of the remakes, so I think it counts. But it's cool too. Like you, if if the word, if a necromancer is on the table, it sh sh like, take it, take the necromancer. Mm -hmm. you no, know? so yeah, I I always support something cool like a necromancer or a lich finding its way into a game. Yep. Um. And whenever this kind of thing comes up, pe I've seen people say that you c that you couldn't that there's no way to make a um a necromancer as the good guy work, and I I always go, um. Let me introduce you to Vecna. Or rather, his head. <laughs> no, that's all that's all you get, just his head. But I do think I do think I do think that it can that it can be done. The when it comes to when it comes to the ne the necromancer um one of the big one of the big questions to to ask is should should this be another one of those entrance entries that's just a just a um, spell list or should it be its own effect or should it be on its own set of effects? So a necromancer in this. I'd say that they that um when it comes that they prob they probably should they probably should have they probably should have um have some have some have some instead of um letting them summon a bunch of skeletons.
And we are back. Apologies for apologies for that. Discord hates me tonight. Um so with the with the necromancer what I'm what I'm mainly th what I'm mainly thinking is a whole lot of a whole lot of a whole lot of um I'm think I'm thinking that I'm thinking that some of their some of their effects some of their abilities can induce drain um probably get probably give them a skeleton companion that they can call upon um I'm not keen on the on the idea of going of going with mass summon undead for them maybe maybe as a capstone <laughs> um but one of the I one of the key of one of the key gimmicks that I'm that I'm strongly that I'm strongly thinking of is it is cheaper for them to spell cast the less HP that they have. Ooh, that's cool. I actually like that. Risk versus reward. The less HP you have, the closer you are to death. Thus, the more death energy you can call on instead of your own MP. It's like mm -hmm. Makes sense. Danger Mario. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kaizo, Kaizo Mario. Yeah. This is a this is a bit of a twist on the wasting away feature that necromancers had in 13th age. I that was one th that was one of those decisions that I didn't care for because the approach that it had is if you had a positive con modifier um a lot of the necromancy spells would actually be penalized. Makes sense. No, that's kind of mm, No, because there are necromancers that have a great tie to life, and that's how they drag the dead back from the dead. Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm so good at life. You're dead? No, you're not. And it's not revival. It's just you. You work again because I fucking say so. Nah, I, I like it better when you die. I, I'm going to go with simple <laughs> and dumb on this. I think, I think, I think that... Um... But just ha just having it that it's easy that it's either easier or more potent to cast spe to cast spells when that when they're closer to death is a bit more elegant of a solution. It is. It allows for things like a positive con modifier, but still rewards being near death. Mm -hmm. Um, and next... it really does make them complete fucking goths too. It's like I cut myself to use my magic. Um. When in my like... uber dark black universe, my blood drips to the ground, calling upon the love of death itself. Okay, That's Thanos. That's how I knew um... this man used to be a goth. Okay, th <laughs> okay, Thanos, sit down. Oh, I'm not. I'm not Thanos. I'm Corvus Corax. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> anybody Holy who's got dark raven black. I mean, anybody who's watched Emperor T Text to Speech Device knows exactly how Corvus <laughs> is. <laughs> oh, I do. Um, now, next is Ravager, and I s I said that this one I had something specific in mind. So, you know how um, when we t Ravager to me is the magical sister to the monk. In some, in one regard, the rav go on the ra the taking the ravager track. You are go you are going to be special. You are going to be specializing in doing sp in doing combinations of spells. The same the same way the monk specializes in hi in at in his attack combos, a ra a ravager is going to spe is going to specialize in um in spe in spell combinations. Not in the sense of combining spells for something bigger, but um, but thro but throwing throwing spells in um chains. First I cast fire, then I cast blizzard, then I cast thunder, and then I cast quake, and now you're dead. Something like something like that. If you if I need to use a video game example, consider Lulu's um overdrive ability. Mm hmm. Where she, where um, where she could she could essentially you could essentially spam a certain spell as long as long as you were um, very br very dexterous when it came to when it came to turn when it came to turning that thing. Although, let's be honest, most of us were most of us were using the palm, you know, because we didn't learn from the original Mario Party. Um, I mean, using the palm is just more effective. What are you talking about? Although truth be, although to be fair, um, the gr 
the lack of the lack of those kind of grooves on the PS2 controller is probably the reason why Sony never had to issue gloves on that whole thing. Walk <laughs> away for 30 seconds to check my hot dogs, and the second I get back, it's like that's why using the palm is so good. There were no grooves. You didn't need gloves. But y your dicks are already out, really, guys. Hardly. I mean, they call it a joystick for a reason, don't they? <laughs> but oh God. do you remember, Joel? Did you ever play the first Mario Party? The very first one was a N sixty four one. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think so. It's been do a while. Do you remember? Do you remember the mini games that involved involve rotating the joystick as as um as fast as you could? Oh yeah, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, though that particular kind of mini game got Nintendo in a lot of hot water. Because there's no padding on the original N sixty four controller joysticks. And also, because those joysticks are not true uh, 360 degree analog like the other analog sticks on on like the PlayStation DualShock controllers, um, those were 8 gate controllers almost like any arcade stick you would see. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And I, I, I have a very vested interest in lots of different things about video games. Yeah. But because sure. of the fact that people that a lot of kids were getting blisters on on their hands to the point where it was called Nintendritis, um, a lot of lawsuits ended up flying, and Nintendo had to issue gloves. <laughs> where this, you dipshits? <laughs> no, N Nintendo eventually learned their their lesson and padded the uh, C stick on the GameCube controller, at least. Mm-hmm. But they have they haven't really they haven't really done those joystick spinning mini games as as often since. I think they I think they were still around in the sequels, but not as frequent. Now, the key th the key thing with the with the um, with the Ravager is uh, is the is the fact that that there is um that as 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 long as the as long as the spe as long as the spells don't hit a certain threshold. There's two kinds of effects that they that they can place on that they can place on their spells. One of them is one of them is doing ch is doing a chain action. So your so um your ca so say you cast fire on one, on one target and then you a you activate this chain, you can you could cast another um another spell of that same tier onto another target as lo as long as it's within mm -hmm. range. Um, I'd say I'd say at hi at higher levels they they can up the highest t the highest tier, and po and possibly um possibly u possibly use mul um multi target spells at the, as the capstone for this kind of thing. So they'd be the so at the highest tier of this kind of th setup, they could um sp they could spam say quake three or four times. That just sounds obscene unless it's flying in which case your quake does nothing yep that sounds pretty nasty um uh. now next is red is red mage and this one is going to be a bit tricky because the main gimmick for the longest time for the red mage is they can ca they can u they can use white and black magic just not as high just not as high as a tier as the um as the white, white or black mage mm -hmm. but the problem is with the track based system we're using you can use white and black magic at the highest tiers by getting the black mage and white mage tracks so the yeah, it, uh, it kind of kills the way red mage work uh like the final fantasy one red mage was basically the 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 uh ad and d elf where you kind of got magic and fighty stuff mm -hmm. uh, so yeah the original it, the track based system kind of kills that because like you can get white magic you can get black magic and you can get fighting you could just make a red mage. The uh, the approach the approach that I'm go the approach that I'm going with is that red is that red mages have have a have um have a spell have a spell list that allow that has that has them do both. They have they keep they keep spe they keep spells around they keep spells around that both that both attack and heal at the same time. Intriguing. Basically, they're a yin yang caster now. 
Yeah. Um. The. The the uh, so because 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 of that because of that, there. It's 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 more about it's more about fig it's more about figuring out how to how to handle the placement of of their spells because instead of instead of a single effect all their they're essentially they're essentially double they're essentially double casting right out of the box whereas a lot whereas a lot of a lot of the other um a lot of the other ca casters would ha wouldn't be able to do double casting until high, until a higher tier Yeah, and you could make part of that challenge, like you said, just the positioning of how you would make sure you did both at the same time, that it would and capture the most benefit from it as you could. Mm -hmm. um, if you wind up like splashing over and healing enemy or hurting a friend, that kind of sucks. Um, one one thing one thing one particular mechanic that I that I've considered um that I've considered giving them is is a imbalance system. Where, whenever whenever they do this, if if they're if they're cast if they're casting if they're casting with black imbalance, their he, the heal that they do won't be as effective, but the attack that they do will be more effective. That actually sounds pretty close to how FF14's Red Mage. Well, cool. That means it has like some actual uh, footing in the Final Fantasy uh, mecha mechanics. Yep. So that actually works great. The the there is the catch the catch, however, is you can, is um you have to you can't you you can't just you can't just jump but you can't just jump between one or the other. You have to you have to skew you have to gradually skew yourself like like you're like you're tipping a scale. So at the at the start of the at the start of the encounter, you say you say um, you're at z you're at zero. Yep. Um. Cat, you. You um, you ca you cast one you cast one of the one end of the spectrum, and that's and that's when you start to gain steps of imbalance. Yeah, and th that's almost exactly like. Uh, Red Mage from FF14. Mm -hmm. uh, they have two. They have two meters that fill as they cast black and white magic spells, each aspected differently. They have white magic attack spells too. So, and um, they have to actually keep the values within a certain range of each other, or they start suffering on one side of the spells. Um, th this is almost exactly FF14's mm -hmm. Red Mage. I'd, I'm probably I'm probably simplifying it compared compared to their approach. Oh yeah, you have the, the rotation for Red Mage when Red Mage first came out was fucking ridiculous. Something like if you wanted to absolute best DPS out of it, thirty six steps. Yeah, thirty six step rotation with all of your on on and off global cooldowns at the cap at the time of level seventy. Um. To to let out your ultimate spell, which was a dual aspected dark light spell that did fuck tons of damage, mm -hmm. um, twice in the rotation. I think it was. Yeah. What's interesting about this design, from a table tabletop standpoint, is that it makes sense to have something like that, which you're actively managing in an uh, in an MMO, because it keeps you engaged with what you're doing. You're not just hitting the attack over and over again button and waiting for the enemy to die. You're you're doing something. To, to kind of like you know interact with the game while you're playing it uh, and that I think is kind of a response to how like static the combat kind of feels in those things because you sort of just stand in a place and do your attack pattern in games like that a lot of times now that's not universal like I, I played a thief in World of Warcraft and I did a lot of sneaking around and moving around uh, mm -hmm. but a lot of times that's like you just kind of you get, you get you know stuck in especially with bosses and so it makes sense to have something that focuses on the player that makes them engage with it. But in a TTRPG, a lot of the times you don't really need that because the situation itself is the challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really clear if the guy with a D6 hit points and a D6 sword damage can get out of the fight alive with three or four orcs. It's, it's actually kind of hairy. Uh, and so it's it, it gives you a lot to think about and to juggle whenever you actually put that onto a character. Um, and I think simplifying it 
I do think there is some some room ru- some room there for fascinating uh, character that kind of has an internalized sense of challenge to them rather than a purely externalized one like something like a fighter would have. It's neat. Yep. Um, now, as far as far as the melee abilities that um, re- that red mages have, I feel like a lot of those are ki- are ki- are kind of covered by the fencer. Yeah, you could just stack fencer on top of red mage and have a fully fleshed. Red Mage from literally any game. Mm-hmm. Um, now, next is Sage, and Sage has 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 kind of done the whole. They can use black and white magic, and they and they can use the strongest the strongest end of it. Um, the approach that I'm taking with Sage, I am stealing the Astral Umbral rotation from the Black Mage in FF14 for this. Oh. Oh, okay. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna steal Sage from FF14 outright, that would be even funnier because it means you get funnels. I mean, no lifts, and you're a healer. Mm, that's a, that's a little too setting specific. I know, but the fact that you can be high new Gundam as as a Sage. It's the best thing ever. There was a there was a meme that came out with Endwalker where the two where the two new classes were were um were described as either High New Gundam or Death Scythe Hell. That's because they are. It's <laughs> Sage. It has four floating, very long laser sticks. Those are funnels. Those mm-hmm. are fucking funnels. And then of course the Reaper. Well, that's self-explanatory. And. For the record, as far as why I didn't put those two in here, um, I the it is way too damn early to do any to do anything to say anything regarding the Reaper or the Sage. We don't mm. know their actual skills; we just know their roles and yeah. kind of what they look like in in action. Mm. Um, not to mention they're extremely setting specific. Yeah, the Sage definitely is. The Reaper, I could kind I could kind of work that as an independent, possibly, but. It's still way too damn early. Ask me ask just, me again in ten months. It just looks like a necromancer that instead of summoning a buddy, uses that buddy to empower himself. Yeah. Um But would could you since given could would you mind um for the benefit of the audience, um going into the um the astral umbral, umbral mechanic that Black Mages have in fourteen? Oh, it was the most interesting thing I ever ran into when I was playing that game, but yes. So the Astral Umbral cycle is a cycle in which a black mage will cast one aspected type of spell, Umbral Aspect, at first. The more he casts, the more stacks of Umbral Aspect he gets, the more powerful the spell gets, and the more MP it costs. Then, casting an Astral Aspected spell would flip everything. You'd lose the stacks of Umbral, you'd get, it with certain skills, full stacks of Astral in, in exchange. And what that does is increases your MP regeneration while doing less damage uh, as a sort of, oh shit, I can't cast Firaga anymore right now because I used all of my MP, cast Blizzaga for a while, let my MP refill, now back to Firaga. Mm-hmm. Um oversimplifying a bit because there's again it's an mmo there's rotations and lots of steps to everything people but uh it it, it was essentially a way to do large amounts of damage for a small sustained period of time then swap to recovery and chip damage back and then back to large amounts of damage for a small sustained period of time it was a very fun rotation to play around with and I really wish I had gotten into Black Mage more. The now, when it comes to when it comes to the approach with the Sage, I I would I would say yeah. that um, I'd pro- I'd probably retitle these um just um um re- reckless and conservative. But it is it is going to it is going to work um it is going to work similarly. Um the hi- the higher circle that you're in, the more um. The more potential, the more the cap you have on how many stacks of it, of it that you can get. Um, 
Now, as far as, as far as what as far as determining what spells are go, are going to be cons are going to be considered um in are going to be considered in that stack, um, that's going to be that's I'm not going to go through each of these spells and and have it go in that regard. It's going to it's going to rely specific specifically on the um player decla declaring the, declaring that they're shifting to that aspect. Essentially, they're they're dealing with a a pair of um, stance stacks. I've got a, a kind of a philosophical question at this point. How it feels like you're you're going to the MMOs a lot with like cause you got this the monk uh, you know the there's, there's a lot of them that kind of reference that. Like, are are you do you feel like maybe we're we're sort of diverging too far from a more classic and universal version of these archetypes like I, I kind of feel like you know sage could just have a certain kind of magic we, we already did that with black mage white like red mage like just do that with them they, they don't necessarily have to have like this this complex multi-step rotation thing like that that, that um, would probably be a better used as a rare spice don't, don't you think um when it comes to i'm not to, i'm not trying to completely replicate the um the rotation. I'm I'm me, uh, merely referencing it as a stylistic thing, and that'd pro that'd probably be. And keep keep in mind keep in mind that the even individual circles within Legend System can be multi-purpose. Um, well, well, granted, and I'm fine with it being multi-purpose. Like I like the Red Mage. I thought that was a really cool way of doing it. Uh, but I feel like you're you're consistently using this this. You will use a cycle kind of format of uh, of designing these classes. When I think think something that's more simple and more elegant would probably not only be easier to design and probably a little more appealing in play, but like I think it would have a broader appeal in general for making a Final Fantasy job based club system. The the only other, the only other the only other well the the big re the big reason that I that I wanted to go with um, Sage is. Some the the a lot of the a lot of the sage entries in pre in previous games um, are more in, are more in the person who knows person who knows all, all the spells. Um, one of the one of the go to examples of this of this kind of thing was um, I, believe, I believe it was either I believe it was either Tala or Fusoya. Tella and Fusoyo yeah. were both technically sages. Yeah, and I, wasn't it Tella who had who had the whole thing of oh I remember I remember I can cast that spell. Oh yeah, and oh yeah, that's how I do that. And that um, that kind of thing isn't going isn't going to really work with this setup. The reason I end up the reason I end up taking my cue from the, from that particular um st that particular um. That particular conservative and reckless thing, and both of them are essentially um, are essentially stances. Um, not going to depend on the magic you cast. You just declare which stance you're going into. Yeah, as a as like a reaction or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can. But the but the idea that that I'm not doing the I'm not doing the idea of having um. Of having st of having the magic and the magic effect be t be tied to s of um conservative or reckless be tied to specific spells. Um, it's more of even if you're casting white magic, you can still t you can still take this approach. You're just increasing the you're just increasing the potency of your healing. Um. With the with the with the equivalent increase in MP use. Mm -hmm. So it actually, I think you, I think you're, um, Joel, I think you're looking at it as if it's more as if it's more complicated than it actually is, or thinking that I'm um, directly trying to lift the um, lift the astral umbral setup at exactly as it is in FF14. I'm using it as I'm using it as a as a as a blueprint because. Of, the reason why I've referenced um, 14, so, 14 so many times in this is 
there is it is that goes a, that goes a significantly further mile in trying to, in trying to give a unique motif to each class. Yeah, FF14 um, very much tries to make sure that the classes all feel distinct, mm -hmm. which would have been better served if they had continued to keep the ro the cross class skills cross class instead of cross role through them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, oh, I'm I'm not salty about what Stormblood did to half the systems in the game, not at all. Um, <laughs> but the the references to FF14 are not meant to be. We're making this game to be like FF14, guys. It's we're trying to find a distinct and unique flavor for each track, mm -hmm. and sometimes FF14 really serves that really well. Yeah. Now. When it comes to the, when it comes to the scholar, um, I look at the I look at the sco the scholar is the is is the per is the person who is on who is on the book smart end of um of spell casting, and because of that, I am going with the idea that that this is the that this is the spellcaster who loves using meta magic, which. Which which reads uh, most of the time, scholar in the games has weird, interesting ways to twist the normal spells. Mm -hmm. So in in so a lot of a lot of the meta magic like abilities that you've seen in D in D and D and and associated styles of games, that's going to be in, that's going to be in the purview of the of the scholar. Yeah, honestly, like scholar sage. Red Mage, like they're all just in most of the games. It looks like it's just oh, we get black and white magic. That's a really common recurring way of distinguishing them, and that just does not work with the tracks. So yeah, I think I'm coming around to your way of thinking about like having to find something else that makes these things mechanically distinct. Yeah, um, and if and to reference another one of the MMOs, FF11 specifically, FF11 Scholar has this. And we, we aren't necessarily in integrating this. We're just integrating the idea that a scholar tweaks spells to work in a different fashion than normal. In FF11, they have this grimoire system, white grimoire, black grimoire, and white uh, appendix and black appendix that add further tweaks onto their spells. And so this is just... We don't have to add those actual, very setting-specific, thematic grimoire... Uh, appendix items just here are ways that scholars tweak spells mm -hmm. now as, as far as, as far as the as far as the catch when it, as far as the limitation when it comes to applying meta magic to spells what i'm considering doing is first one is free you can put you can put it you can put as many as many more after that as you like but in doing so you're going to be increasing the mp cost in some cases. Mm -hmm. So if you want to throw all, if you want to throw all your meta magic on, onto onto it onto that spell, yeah, you can. But you're going to be burning through your M, you're going to be burning through your MP real fast. One way to go, Nova. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to the summoner. There's t there's a, there's a couple there's a couple of routes that we can t that we can take this, we can take this the um we can take this the ten and twelve way, where you're where you're calling them out and the, and they are a, they are a full, a a um a, a essentially an extra party essentially a um extra party member in some cases that you can't control or the or um they end up t they end up taking the um, com commands instead of instead of a party like in um, ten, or we can take the approach of they sh of them being an uber spell like it's been through a lot of the um a lot of one through nine. I think that's that's a tough one too. Well, no, because I'm looking ahead in the list, and we've got yokai, and we'll get to that. I think in this case, it would be best to have summoner pull the summon as a pet or as as a uh, a henchman whatever you're going to call it a companion party member that's temporary um and in 
I know that we already had the idea with Necromancer to do that with the dead, maybe a, a single companion dead for them. Mm -hmm. In this case, a summoner would have a, a list of summons they could pull from. Each one costs various amounts of MP depending on how strong or weak they are. Um, and then uh, in this case, I think they need to have either a hard turn limit because summons can always absolutely just mangle a battle. Or they need to have a, a form of upkeep, a very strict form of upkeep. I actually completely agree. Because um, I think whenever you're talking about summoner, it has to summon something, mm -hmm. right? It, it can't just be that it swaps something out or it does a different kind of blast. It's a little too dull. That's mechanically represented that way because it's a lot easier for a designer of a video game. But for us, like, we already have rules for monsters and characters. Like, it's not that hard to do the more interesting option there. And yeah, I'm agreeing with you that it should be powerful enough that there should be a, a significant limitation to how you can use it. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, w a, not even a turn limit, but let's say, for example, you want to summon a water summon. Is there a source of water nearby? Um, in the, in when it comes to when it comes to that, the the approach. The there's there's a few there's a few approaches that I can th I can think of. Um, one one approach that I, that I was considering is the is the I is the idea that they're that they're summoning a com they're not summoning the full size thing they're summoning a compa a um a companion. Um, and actually this is this is an instance where I'd be taking a bit of a cue from. D and D fourth edition, specifically the shaman class. In this case, you're actually going to have to uh, expound on that for me, since, as I said, I never got a chance to play fourth. The thing now, the shaman, ha the shaman had a had a um, had a partner spirit in in the, in um in that one one who one who they could give up action they, some of their actions to to maneuver around as need be but um more importantly when it came to when it came to their when it came to spell casting the sh the shaman could use that could use that spirit as the as the focal point for the spell cast so sort of similar to how some wizards with familiars can cast spells through their familiars except in this case this if you're not casting through the spirit the spirit is just where the spell's going to go off. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Because mm -hmm. uh, the the idea the idea of somebody th of somebody throwing around the fu the full might the full might of Efreed for it for instance, I'm. I feel I feel like that might be pushing it a little bit. You're starting so small, Monk. Why didn't you think of the giant dragon that can obliterate people with a laser breath? Even <laughs> the full might of Bahamut, yeah. Mega Flare. <laughs> oh, if you're gonna if you're gonna go that far, I figured you'd break out Bahamut Zero or something. Oh no no no, we don't we don't need that excessive. We could always go the strangely evil Bahamut in the novelization of Final Fantasy XV who wants to gather all the darkness to shoot Terra Flare and destroy the planet. Um, or, um, <laughs> or let, let's not forget Eden. We don't talk about an animation so long I can literally screw up ten times and still hit max boost gauge. <laughs> But yeah, I do. Th I, I do think that when it comes to the, I think a good compromise is that um, is that there are certain, that um, a lot of a lot of their abilities are are going to be about manu are going to be about maneuvering a sm a smaller form of summon, with a with a very limited very limited use effect of um, of being of being able to call upon the bit call upon the bigger version. Basically, basically as a last resort. In fact, I'd pro in fact I'd probably have that be the the equivalent of a of a limit break, or a, that or would make a, a good summoner limit break. Yeah, like like the or as you said the capstone where um 
only in the last turn they are able to have the summon out as well. Mm-hmm. Like, so you have to have it survive for a few turns before you can use your nuke. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it, there needs to be a sufficient penalty for that. Maybe you're reduced to zero MP. Mm-hmm. Dump all your MP to have the Hobbit use Mega Flare. There you go. Yeah. Um. Oh, I'll... man. White Mage, think think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I do th- I do think that White Mage should be given some degree of offensive ability, not as which much is, as Black Mage, but still but still throw a little bit of a bone. Which is again where we where we pulled a little bit from FF14. In FF14, the White Mage has Arrow and Stone as offensive spells. Yeah, because you can't. You can't go soloing as a white mage and have no way to attack. Um, <laughs> uh, now, arrow and stone are okay spells. Um, stone is their is primarily their single targeting spells because as arrow gets bigger, it turns into an AOE. But they're nowhere near as powerful as any of their heals. So yeah. Um. And. When it com- and when it comes to when it comes to yokai, um, I I this is where this is where I want I want to uh, shift it over to you. Okay, so the yokai is an interesting type of summoner. In Bravely Second, what the yokai does is rather than summoning and conjuring the summon, they instead invoke the summon to call upon the powers of hell and cast very interesting and powerful magic. Um, the examples in Bravely Second are things like using Goethe Blulu, the first summon, to actually invoke the name of Asmodeus and uh, cast a lust-based spell and the level 4 fire spell Firaja. Um, it's it doesn't necessarily need to have that exact theming, but it's a, it's instead of using a summon to call on your little friend, you're using the summon as a glorified spell, which earlier we said we didn't want Summoner to do that. Mm-hmm. But in this case, you're also using it as a way as a way to get access to very strange spells, spells that aren't necessarily just fire for. Ice four, thunder four, quake four, or whatever equivalent of the high level spells you want to get to. This is going to be you invoke a summon to get a fiend spell, and the theming can be mostly up to the discussion between GM and and player, and of course the setting that you might be playing in. Mm-hmm. But in the end, the spells are going to be unique in specific fashions i do want i do have to wonder if the, if this is what if this is one of those situations where um where a yokai can do in the case of yokai do you think that they should be able to do some degree of full-on spell craft full-on freeform spell crafting it can't be completely freeform because it does have to be based off of a summon. The yokai specifically needs this ultra being to call upon in order to cast the spells they have access to. But within the theme of whatever summon they choose as uh, for that level of spell, um, I assume they could craft it in such a way as to have a specific set of effects. Obviously, again player needs to discuss this with gm yeah. that's got to be a, a whole gm fiat thing mm-hmm. or maybe there's a table we we give depending on theming of this type of summon um you know here are the effects build a summon out of these themes maybe here are the yeah. effects build a summon out of these themes this is one of your spells you did the same thing they did in um exalted with the infernals too where like you just have like this big list of like key themes and as long as you can justify the effect within those broader themes then it should work yeah yeah exactly that that would that would be perfect Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's well it got a lot of praise Uh, there was a oh who designed that one uh neil raymond price uh designed that one and it was pretty revolutionary at the time i honestly think it's it's still some pretty like top shelf design so do something along those lines 
And I mean, we love Exalted Second around here, so I mean, you know, you're not. Oh, you're not it's a love hate relationship. <laughs> I would rather run second than third. I'll put it that way. And we'll leave, and <laughs> no, same, we'll leave it at that. same. Like, that is. <laughs> Doesn't say that I. That doesn't say that there's anything that really ultimately redeems the second. It's just that I really don't like. Third. We <laughs> again. A, we we, we won't get into that. Hey, yeah. That's that's a discussion. I mean, like especially with me. Like that's just a discussion for another time. That that's mm -hmm. going to be its own several hour long session. Yeah. Um, oh wait, we're going to turn into your therapists for this. Nice. Yes. <laughs> Oh, um, no, it's a support group. We're like AA, except it's, it's EA, Exalted Anonymous. I remember Maybe. the first time one of my players took a Grand Diclave. I didn't believe in the 2-7 filter before. I was on <laughs> Exalted forums, and I just thought, ah, it's all poppycock. And, uh, no. <laughs> Seven Shadows Invasion! Anyway, so. Anyways. So, <laughs> next we have Adept. And the adept class is basically the catch-all for those um, for those motifs that are a bit more of a hybrid between the between the others, as 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 we mentioned last night. And the first one we have is Beastmaster. No, not that one. And anyone who insists on that one, I'm going to force you to watch Beastmaster too. Eh. Do you want ferrets? Because that's how you get ferrets. Um. So when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the be when it comes to the um, Beastmaster, um, I am uh, I am of I'm of the mind of having them be a bit of a skinwalker if you get if you catch my drift. But all those poor animals and their skins they need those. Not as much as I do, motherfucker. Give me your skin, Bambi. <laughs> I hate you. Although as far as far as, as far as killing all, as far as as far as shooting Bambi, yep. In that case, I'm like, ah, go ahead. At least we at least we got a good lampooning of it during during Animaniacs. <laughs> um. But I do I do think I do think Beast I do think Beastmaster should be should be our should be a requisite ex, requisite instance of so of someone who someone who's able to do um to do some form of shape shifting. Whether whether it be whether it be doing the cl the classical the classical wear person or even even the um, body even the body transformations that Vincent does as his limit breaks. Yeah, but those body transformations are because he's possessed by the the literal god of chaos. The i the 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 the, the conceptual idea of chaos inhabits Vincent. Let's not let's not over let's not understate the facts here. Oh, I I am I'm most certainly not. <laughs> but I do I do think I do think that I do think that kind of approach would be more, would be more apropos. Um mm -hmm. if you need no. to use another example, consider the lunar exalted. Yeah, yeah, I was good about to say. Now, good question here. Uh I'm guessing we're again we're going to leave beast theming up to the player, and they get certain levels of beasts they can shift into mm. based on the circles they get from the track. Yeah. Okay. Now, is there going to be any? So, for example, let's say they choose some sort of beast that has a special ability. Uh, let's use one of my favorites, the Displacer Beast. That's going to need to be a higher circle in order to inherit the actual displacer beast's displacement abilities, correct? Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking, of, what I'm thinking of having is that the circle is essentially denotes the highest, um, the highest level of beast that they that they can, um, that they, whose form they can adopt. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, because they can shift into numerous different types of beasts, um, they could be. A fighter, they could be a harrier, they could, they're in mind flayer, they could be a caster. Or, you know, suck people's brains out through their eye sockets. Why are we drawing the line at beast between beast and monster? Like, we're we talking about, like, somewhat animalistic, or, like like you said, is a, like a, a mind flayer, or a lich, a dragon? Like, where, where's the line here? 
the line the line is the line is how how the highest circle that the, that they have because um if we if we just if we just stuck to to um animals in the traditional sense um we that would end up being a bit limiting in my opinion and a bit and lean a bit into the spe setting specific end of things cuz if we put if we put that one of the starting ones is wolf how are we going to justify that if they if they're in the if the um, player in that case is in the middle of a desert. Or if they live in the Xanarkin Abes! The wolves in Xanarkin. Mm -hmm. You... Do you really wanted to reference people that are that loserish? Yes, I did. Good job. I will take no more comments at this time. Mm -hmm. at, um, least, at least you can admit to your problem. Now, when it comes to... When it comes to blue mages... Um... I am not, I I do not I do not relish the idea of you of using the of using the blue of having a list of blue magic spells because in this in a traditional sense because that means I'd have to I'd have to I'd have to um put I'd have to put in the list of when it comes to what spells are blue ma are blue magic learnable in the bestiary as well which is okay for a video game since you can quickly and uh, change all that. But uh, for a TTRPG, it, it you know again settings you're going to be in multiple places, multiple multiple systems. Since this is intended to be transplanted anywhere fairly easily, um, you could say, well, you can learn big guard or or mighty guard from a from an iron giant. Iron giants don't exist in this world. Uh, okay, bye. <laughs> so, the the approach I've ap successfully uh, I've successfully slotted in blue magic into old school D and D campaigns by just saying that if a monster does it and you eat that monster, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, it and that's kind of a sloppy way of doing it. And it's not. I don't like. I don't want to entertain the notion that it is somehow balanced. <laughs> Because it isn't like you can't balance that in the same way that you balance spells or something like that. But it it is effective and really fun. So there there's at least some like real play tested trod ground as far as doing something along those lines. Yeah. Um. Of course the pro the the appro the approach that the approach that I that I int that I intend on um take on taking with this is. Each cir each circle you have a set of. And I, I will admit I'm I'm blatantly taking some notes from the mutation mage from Era Lost Legend. The approach that I have is that they they do have a ba they do have a basic um magic attack spell. Um, back in Era it, back in Lost Legend it was called Barrage. Um, it's basically it's a non-elemental hits you spell. Yeah. The the approach that that they have is um when it comes to when it comes to these slots any um any spe any um spell that th that they've that they've been hit that they've been hit with they can they can slot in they can slot into into that into one of the into one of those um well slots and you and utilize the, and utilize that with their own statistics as if they, as if they knew it um and of co of course, um, the uh, the there's there's the there's two uh, there's um the key the key thing the key thing with this is there are go there are going to be there's going to be ultimately a bigger variety of uh, of att of attacks and effects that you that you're going that you're going to get hit with than you are going to have slots even at the highest amount. Um, so you gotta pick and choose. Yeah, and because of and because of that, one of the other actions that you have is essentially to um, either bur to burn it or forget or um, forget it. Forgetting it, self-explanatory. Burning it, you're using you're using essentially a souped-up version of that effect, but after you use it, it's gone. That does seem to keep them engaged and consistently like hunting out weird stuff, and I think that's. That's an important part of being a blue mage is that you got to find something cool to leech your powers off of. I kind of like that. Oh. And the the burning part, um, 
I think the the penalty for that, other than you lose it, is uh, of course a higher MP cost as usual. Yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to the Dark Knight, we already know it's cast from hit points. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It is. It is. It is very. It is very much still. Still cast from hit points. Um. A lot, and because of that, a lot of um, a fair, a fair, a fair amount of a fair amount of ranged effects. Um. I would say I um. I would say I would say that they, that that as they develop further, they they can they can kind of cust they can kind of customize it in their own twisted form of meta magic. I mean, it is their blood that they're using, so. Um, I think and... Cecil was way more useful as a Dark Knight than as a Paladin. I alone in that, like, he was, like, way more badass. Like, he'd kill whole screens of enemies at once, and then he becomes a Paladin, and it's like, I can guard one person. Yeah, but the only person I wanted to guard was Cecil, because he could kill a whole screens full of enemies. And you murdered him, you, you loser. He murdered himself. He what? He did. <laughs> um, have he you ever? Have by you ever, refusing to attack himself? Did you? Did you ever play um, any of the Dissidia games, Joel? Uh, nah. They they were actually didn't. really good. First of all, first you know what's yeah. weird. I've heard that and I believe it. Like, I don't see why they wouldn't be good. You know. But when it came to how they did Cecil, they 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 did they did something a bit unique. Um, it changes between Dark Knight and Paladin. Yeah. All right. That's it, what he did in the games. No, but he does it fluidly, depending on what attacks you're using. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> and it could lead to some pretty busted combos, although he was still only like a B-tier character mm -hmm. because Cloud of Darkness is broken as hell and Ultimecia even more so. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> Ultimecia would be pretty broken. Ultimecia was triple S and the only triple S character in the game because she could zone so well you could never get close to her. Nice. Are you referring to the PSP games or NT in that regard? PSP because those are the only ones I played. NT she wasn't at, she wasn't as broken and actually um because of the because of the fact that you couldn't that dashing wasn't so stupid easy, a lot of ground-based tactics were a bit more viable, which mean which meant Furion sucked a little bit less. Yeah, leveling Fury on to get rid of the bow, uh, a brave or the bow HP attack was a pain in the ass on the mm -hmm. on the PSP versions. Yeah, and I actually feel like we're wandering. And yeah, rails. But um, now the ne I had I had been I had been um I had been tooling around for a while about how, about whether or not I'd even be able to simplify the Geomancer, and. This is one of those cases where I can, where I really can't. And my answer is a simplified geomancer. We already have one. Mm -hmm. Look at the best Final Fantasy ever. He dances. Mog the Moogle is the best geomancer ever. What are you talking about? No the the point is the point is is that no matter how no matter how much I no matter how much I want to slice it, um. The geomancer's effects are are going to be based on having a specific set of spells based on the, based on the terrain. Based on the, the location, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no. Um, the only way I could poss I could possibly simplify it is instead of going with individual terrains, um, have it have it be based on the on the elemental aspects that are present. But even then, that means you have to make a map of elemental aspects. Yeah, I mean, I can prob I can probably cover a fair bit of ground with with the bit with the basic six. Um, you know, fi but, fire, er fire, earth, water, air, light, and dark. I mean, but in a lot of Final Fantasy games, water and ice are considered separate elements. They even have separate protections. And then, of course, it, it gets complicated. Let's yeah. not get into it. The point. The point is, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the geomancer, it is it is still very much a ter a terrain caster. Um, 
I would have its I would have its capstone the ability to change the the uh, terrain to suit it. So temporarily changing the snowfield you're on into a fucking volcano. Yes. Ah, that's a fantastic capstone. I'd love that. That's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd that's, be like, that's five stars right there. I need I I need the fire spells. We're in the middle of a frozen glacier. Oh. I've got my capstone ability. Ryan's volcanoes. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, um, okay. So my my suggestion then is is to try and simplify. You identify maybe at the very least six different terrain types. At the very most mm -hmm. ten. Um. And then you assign small spell lists to each, and that lets uh, a geomancer know what they can roughly expect from the terrain type. You, and their passive class ability is knowledge of what terrain type they're in at that time. It's mm -hmm. something the GM will tell them in an encounter at any point. Yeah. Now That streamlines it. Now, next is Illusionist. Um, Eisenhorn the Illusionist? Um, I will I will admit that when I vi when I visualize someone taking the illusionist track, I keep coming back to the mesmer from Guild Wars One and Two. I'm sorry. The only thing I can think of when you just say the illusionist is a fantastic film with Ed Norton and Paul Giamatti. <laughs> um, but the the illu the illusionist um the illusionist that I'm th that I'm thinking of in this in this regard is. This would probably this would probably be a this would probably be the equivalent of a enchant centric wizard. Well, I mean, like, yeah, like that's basically what it was in classic D and D too. It was just a guy that had a lot of illusion magic, but they were effectively just wizards with a more specialized spell list. Um, I'd I'd say I'd say what I'd say the the big th the big thing with them is um is uh, is is me is messing with the messing with the senses for one and also I'd say one of the I'm not sure if it would be a capstone but one of the effects that they'd probably have is ma is making people see duplicates of 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 themselves. That just sounds like the veil spell. Mm -hmm causes people there to miss a, there's a spell isn't it like uh oh, what is that where you like you have like d4 spectral images and if they hit one of the other ones that isn't you it vanishes actually uh, i like have a chance to hit is like there's like a percentage based on how many are left actually i have a year i just had a eureka moment don't worry right, i'm cool, not i'm here. not gonna go out streaking like a archimedes look we're not here to judge this is a judgment free zone mildred so the default is being able to do spectral illusions. But as you develop as an illusionist, you can create certain you can create certain effects that activate when one of those spectral illusions is hit. Mm. So it's an illusion kinds of ways to pop the bubbles, eh? Yeah. I was gonna say it's an illusionist that activates trap cards. Yep. Obligatory <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh reference. No, no, that's that's pretty apropos, though. I figure, I figure that do I figure that doing this would be a good would be a good way to ha to have the illusionist um act actually actually con actually contribute instead instead of just instead of just playing uber defense. I think the capstone should be that one of the spectral illusions is essentially an actual double. Yeah. The key thing, like, the key thing with the spectral illusions is, they can, they can, t they can take move actions, they can take minor actions, but they can't attack. A capstone is that is that the, is that, um, is that as as long as long as they're as long as they're attacking the as long as it's the same target as you, as your mm -hmm. as the, as whoever you're targeting, they can attack. E. And so your spectral illusions are all gathered around you. Fivefold strike, bitches! Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, that just reminds me of so many wuxia films. I love it. Mm -hmm. 
That is pretty cool. Now, next is Magic Knight. Ah, the rune swordsman. The different... The, guys, this is just... Here's my sword. I cast fire on sword. Sword is now fire sword. Or at least, that's how it usually is in the games. Mm -hmm. um, Admittedly, that is kind of rad, though. The, <laughs> You're not wrong. The the approach that the approach that I'm going with is there is they have a de they have a default escalating spell simply sim called some called some version of um art of arcane sword i.e. a ba a basic make th make this do more damage kind kind of kind of effect. Um. Okay. <laughs> I, honestly, I I that's really good. You know, it, you can because it's combinable with so many different things, and a lot of times with these tracks, that's all you need. You know, you just need like something that's strong enough to combine with something else. How, however, like however, however, um, the the um, so as they as they go through the circles, they can they can um, if they if they can um, I'm th I'm thinking of I'm thinking of having it that they that. They can, that they can uh, they can um Im they can imitate either imitate um um spell of spell effects from from one of the from one of the other tracks, or they or they have their or they have their own versions of those kind of things. Um, I'm thinking that, well, like Joel was saying, if you know, you have that scaling arcane sword spell, and depending on what other tracks you take, you could easily combine magic from, say, Cosmic Mage or Summoner, or any, well, not Summoner, but Yokai, or any of those others, to imbue into the arcane sword skill. I, th I think that as the circles go up, it should be the degree to how far the imbuement is allowed like, that I'm perfectly er willing to go with with one um with what with one little tweak um sing um single you single use at single as spell use effects can are can still be applicable so they so if they if they're a magic knight but they haven't taken a spell casting track if they if they buy a if they buy a sing, a single use magic scroll for instance they can use that as a um, workaround as an imbuement yeah that makes sense because you know somebody may choose magic knight as a as just because they like the idea of having magic sword but they don't want to get any casting classes because maybe they just don't want they, maybe they'll think they'll be too squishy, or they just won't have the versatility they want. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Weren't you able to have someone else cast on your rune sword? That class, and, like, what if you just have like a black mage friend, and you're like, "Hey, bro, um, my sword's ready for you," and he's like, "I'm casting," and then bam, magic sword. That's where because when a when a black mage loves an arcane swordsman very much, um, <laughs> sometimes. He will I take don't his think magic and he will imbue his weapon. I don't it. think I don't think VV loved Steiner that much. Oh, I think I think that there's some subtext that he did. No, VV was totally all over uh, Zidane. I th I think I'm you say there's a lot of VVs at the end. I think I think you need to get off Tumblr, Joel. <laughs> nah, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Um, no, you, you you missed the perfect, you missed you missed the perfect reference. You have to pull it, because in this case, I'm gonna pull it, and Monk's gonna hate me. <clears throat> Duly noted and ignored. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna hate you for that. Why not? It implies you're the Star Scream, and I'm Megatron, mm -hmm. or in this case, Galvatron. Um, <laughs> but when it. Now, when it comes now, um, moving on to the next one, when it comes to ninja, um, one of the one of the one of the big issues we need to address is a signature feature of of the ninja class is, has always been ability to use two weapons. Um, and the other signature uh, signature part of the ninja class, we'll get to. Yeah. 
So when it when it comes to when, now, dual wielding is one is one of those things where there's a lot of argument about how about how to do it, and because of these because of the um, weapon setup, um, we can't we can't we can't use two we can't use two wep any sort of two weapon setup out of out of the box. The approach that I'm, the approach that I'm going with. You remember the reversion thing that I that I mentioned. This is the approach that I'm that I'm considering going with, and it's not the first time I've used this. Um, when we, if somebody ha at the start, if somebody has the ninja track, they can if um if they roll if they roll and they, if they end up rolling low, like if they end up rolling a ten or less, they can flip the die at the at the cost of reducing damage. So that basically, if they roll an eight, they still get a twelve. Yeah, they're just doing less damage. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically a case of if the if the left one do, if the left hook doesn't get you, the right one will. Yeah, no, I get that. I I think I think that's a ni I think that's a nice little trade off without having to fall into some of the traps that other games have dealt with when it comes to dual wielding. I think uh, at higher levels, or I should say higher circles, uh, they should be allowed to just have two attacks in a single round. I'm, I'm perfectly in a single turn. I'm perfectly fine with that being with that being a high, a higher tier approach. Yeah, like at first you have I'm swinging with one sword. Oh no, I missed. So I'll swing with my offhand and hit you for a little less, but still hit you. Mm -hmm. Whereas later on, it's like, I've gotten real good at this. Fuck you. You get two daggers to the face, motherfucker. Yeah. And when it, now, when it comes to some of the um, spell-like abilities that the ninja has, I'm I'm con I'm considering I'm considering having the, having those as keeping keeping those in the in the similar vein, but they um, but the sp but the spell cat but the um, the spellcasting modifier is physical. They are, they are basically, um, in some, they're basically a dex equivalent of the muscle wizard. Utsutsemi, never get hit for one physical attack. Thank you very much. I love you, Utsutsemi. Um, that's that, and when, of course, when I'm br when I'm bringing that up, I'm, I'm, con I'm considering the um, ninja abilities that Edge had in. Um, in four, yeah, the scrolls, mm -hmm. different nin ninja, ninjutsu magic. Yeah, that's cer that's certainly that's certainly one po that's certainly one possibility. The the um, I think the I think the key thing is that the, is that they sh is that they should ha it should be a whole lot of um tricks. And then of course, the final core of ninja. Throw weapons. Um, given given the weapon setup that Legend has, I'm not I'm not entirely sure if that's going to translate. Well, and that's why um, you instead use a, a more again the whole skill based thing. You make it like you have throw level one, you have ninjutsu level one, and then of course you have the the dual attack setup that we have. That's probably only going to use two circles. Mm -hmm. So you ha so you have throw it throw and ninjutsu level one level two and then of course ninjutsu level three because ninjutsu level one and two or throw level one and two are probably never going to need to be more than necessary. The small throw level one would be things like small shuriken, kunai, tiny things like that, and then level two would be something like a fuma shuriken, you know, like Yuffie's giant fuck off cross shuriken, mm -hmm. something big and massive and fuck off and die. Yeah. Um, of course, if you use that, well, uh, no, no attacks for you that round. Mm -hmm. But that's because you threw something that's gonna, well, possibly plow somebody's face into minced meat. Mm -hmm. um, now then we get then we get um, Oracle. I can see the future. <laughs> um. Now, when it when 
the Oracle in, um, for all intents and purposes, the Oracle in, um, Final Fantasy Tactics was an Onmyunji. Yes, Onmyunji, indeed. Mm -hmm. Um. But they were no Shiki Slinger. No. <laughs> but, uh, and we, we can't do, we can't do the Yin Yang casting because we already, di we already did that with the, um, with the Red Mage. <laughs> I'm th I'm thinking th I'm thinking that the um that when it, that when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the um or when it comes to the oracle that it should it should be it should be a case of um of per we do ha it's we are taking notes from the whole gambit thing again but in this case it's more of trying trying to trying to pr trying to predict the way the dice are going to, are going to roll, i.e., there, it's kind. I'd say it'd be an I'd say it'd be an inverse of flexible attacks, wherein um they act they activate their they activate their effects based on the natural die results of the enemy. You told him to get off Tumblr. He did it to defy you. Yeah, I yeah I kind of walked into that. But, I wish we had a sideshow Bob to play right now. Mm -hmm. But that's the approach. That's the approach I'm thinking. I'm thinking of going that they that they they pr they predict the f they predict the future, or rather they they predict what's they predict the enemies the enemies um movements and 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 um the way the dice are going to roll and that and that's how they activate their particular forms of buffing and debuffing. Okay. In which case, it's a buffer, a debuff, and just thematically, they're reading the future. Yeah. And reading. I the can see the future. Mm -hmm. You know, and and in set in setting, you can argue that they're manipulating luck or something. Oh no! Please, let's not turn them into Scarlet Witch. Mm -hmm. oh. I don't need them to manipulate probability. <laughs> So next is paladin. Now, a lot of classic paladins in this regard they have some they have some white magic ability and they have cover. I That's, can get in the way. That is not going to be sufficient. Um. So, I'm trying I'm trying to remember the I'm trying to remember the gimmick that paladins had in um in fourteen because I didn't use paladins all that much. Oh, they didn't have a gimmick um the the paladins in 14 are the second best tank in the game right now um and their whole thing is they're just sword and board holy knights with the ability to take the hit and, and not let everybody else die they are they are as far as I'm aware, they're some of the least played class simply because they're so bog standard. Which which means we which means we have the unenviable task of finding a way to make it to make a paladin less bo less bog standard. I can think of no better place to do that than with the Templar from the Brave Le Default series. Okay. The Saints, the Holy Knights. So, their gimmick is they are so light that, uh, first of all, light loves them to the point that they don't get damaged by light elemental attacks as much. Um, they have the ability to use light-based physical attacks. Uh, and, of course, their guard is you know stronger than most. They get higher critical chances with magic and um one of the more interesting things is they have effects that are dependent on opponents status in in association with yourself for example giant slayer deal uh one and a half times the damage of a conventional attack to one opponent with more hp than you um or Unleash an attack for a guaranteed critical hit that deals two times damage of a of a conventional attack, but then they lose 
one of the resources in that game, uh, Brave Points, which means they technically lose a turn at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the Templar, if we're going to use it as the, as the basis for the Paladin, uh, you still got your light magic-y funness, but they don't need white magic because we've got a white mage for that, so if you want to get white magic on your Paladin, just grab white mage. Mm -hmm. um, they instead would have a system of of uh, light based, they, they'd have the ability to imbue uh, physical attacks with light based elementa elementation, which we haven't had a lot of light based attackers. Even technically, uh, White Mage would only have Holy as like a capstone spell, and even then, it's going to be something you don't use very often. Mm -hmm. This guy can just lay it down. And then, of course, if we're going to take into effect the, the, um, the spending of turns as what the Templar does. We can think of the Templar here as having some of the archers same uh, putting themselves at the bottom of the initiative table to get an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you could use Heart Strike. Uh, put yourself at the bottom of the, of the initiative table to deal a, that, so that you open up your critical range, and if you do a critical hit, it does double what a, a critical hit normally does. I mean, obviously, we'd have to balance things out. Maybe maybe it's not double critical hit, it's just a normal critical hit and opens up your range. Um, maybe if you have light equipped on the weapon and you're attacking something weak to light, it does a double critical instead. Something of those lines. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the end, they even have a ranged light attack that is still physical-based. A Radiant Blast. Um... It's a light-based physical attack on a target that ignores a defending damage reduction effect. For, so if somebody takes the a defense-based ill, mm -hmm. like not like just block, like they choose to block that turn, it would it would ignore the reduction from a a simple block. But like if it's a spell or like shell or or if it's a specific skill for a certain track, those would still apply. Yeah. Um. And in that re respect, the final thing that a Templar does really well is big damage with Critical Amp. It raises the damage of criticals beyond what criticals normally do. Mm -hmm. And we could we could make that the capstone. And instead of a passive effect, it's an active effect. The next critical you, pr you perform, or for example, you cast it as a reaction to a critical make it a once per encounter power rather than anything that cost MP or a turn. Mm -hmm. um, you you deal that that critical, you then cast your capstone effect of you, you know whatever we want to call it. Um, and you deal a critical that maybe does three times damage. And that's the way you could change the paladin. They'd still have cover. They'd still have high defense t stuff. Mm-hmm. Because the co the cover is still the key of of what paladin used to be, but the templar, which is very much built off of the DNA of of a of a um, paladin without the cover ability baked in, because that's baked in knight and bravely default, um, could be used as a way to give this paladin its own identity. Mm -hmm. You you combine. The cover aspect of what is normally expected of Paladin, take away the white magic aspect because we have white magic elsewhere, and you can just slot that in as a de as a separate track, and then add some of the Templar stuff on top of it, in order to give it a, a more feel of, because a Paladin, I mean the, the Knights Templar were technically Paladins mm -hmm. by by definition. Yes, Paladin is a warrior for the light, your deity, whatever it's called, going forth to stomp out the darkness, unbelievers, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they were not just a defensive bulwark, they were, fuck you, I'm taking Jerusalem. For one reference. Yeah. <laughs> um, and because I do th I, uh, I do think that a, that a particularly potent combination would probably end up being would probably end up being a um pal a paladin combined with 
to say Sentinel. <laughs> Not only can I say, fuck you, here's an increased critical threat range, and oh, I hit that crit reaction for my once encounter power, three times crit. You hit me? Pink? Hmm. You scuffed my armor. Take a boot to the face. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> Rune Knight, I think, is going to be very straightforward. There's not a whole lot we need to um, we need to really mess around with with Rune Knight. We can just use the we can just use the runic ability from six, and half the work's done for us. Ding! I absorb your magic. Fuck you. Yeah. I love runic. That's such a good ability. Um. Now, as far as and of course, of course, they probably have their they probably have their own um their own effects to you to use that 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 is that is that is based on that. Um, I'm debating whether or not I'd have the I'd have the approach that if that if you're ta that if you're taking um ru if you're taking Rune Knight, you um your MP starts at zero, and you have to absorb it as you go. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Um. And then there's Sword Saint. Um. I am consider. I'm considering use. I'm considering using this. To would you? Would using the counting the counting up timer from FF6 be a good idea here? I'm kind. I'm kind of leaning towards no. No, because unless you had a very short count to go through, you'd likely never hit some of the end game stuff. Because remember that that Cayenne's uh, sword sword play gauge was up to eight, mm -hmm. and also that it was broken in the fact that uh, if you were playing on wait mode, waiting until it hit eight, nothing attacked you. <laughs> but remember everybody weight mode's only for pussies yeah the uh, the uh, so in s when it comes to when it comes to um so when it comes to sword saint i do f i do feel i actually um i'm actually of the mindset of you of utilizing um, the key system in Anima. Okay, I could see that. Mm -hmm. And we... Oh, welcome back, Joel. I'm glad to see I'm not the only one who's having Discord issues. <laughs> sorry about that. Yep. You didn't get to input for anything for like two jobs, man. I'm sorry. Those are some fast damn jobs, man. The premature ejaculator jobs. They came and they went. I don't know about that. We we discussed uh, Paladin pretty pretty in depth there for a good yeah. like three or four minutes. Yeah, I was listening to that. Did you guys not hear my input on it? Ah, crap. No, <laughs> no, I did. No, we didn't. Oh, oh well. Um. <laughs> it wasn't. I was basically agreeing with you, so don't yeah. feel bad. Um, um, okay, but I, did we? Do, are you done with Sword Saint? Because I like to. I like no. the idea of the count up timer quite a bit. If there are different effects depending on how high up it is. Because I like whenever combat does that kind of scaling thing. The the, the issue the issue it the issue is, um, you would end you would end up with you would end up with a situation where where somebody is, um, where somebody is is trying to hold is trying to hold out several turns, not doing anything. No, I think I see I think I see where Joel's going with this. Hold on. Well, I mean. Yeah, why why not why why make it not do anything? Why don't you just say that every round you get a different thing you can do? You know, so turn one it's just an attack with like some little flourish, and then turn two you get some extra thing, and then turn three you get another extra thing. Like you just you get deadlier as the fight goes on. Actually, another another eureka moment. The sword saint the sword saint would probably would probably be would probably be a great way to in to include to introduce. Um, the escalation die. Ah, yeah, from Thirteenth Age. Mm -hmm. You know, a game we've been referencing quite a few times in this whole thing. Honestly, like Final Fantasy and Thirteenth Age, like they're they're very conducive design. 
Well, there, there's also the fact that Thirteenth Age is very, very flexible with with how it approaches. It is as as far as as far as I'm concerned, it does what it does what um, Fifth Edition promised me and didn't deliver on. Because when I wasn't when I because I was promised a uniting of the editions and that didn't happen. I mean, if you exclude Fourth, it kind of did. I can't. I can't even. Ex well, when I when I reviewed it, I had I had, I had reviewed it in the context of that uniting of the editions. But um, there's a, but there's a lot of things that it t that it takes from previous editions without really understanding why those things were made. Yeah, th there's a lot of that in D and D generally. I find. But I mean, like every D and D like kind of has those problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Pathfinder has a lot of baggage that doesn't really need from D and D, you know. Um, so yeah, I it, I don't even want to. I, I, it's hard to even call it disappointing because it's just like this is the fifth edition of D and D, and it's that's not even like necessarily accurate. It's more like the fifteenth edition if you're counting all like BX and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Like the D and D you love exists in some form if you gotta kind of couple it together. So I guess I'm glad that fifth exists. I like the advantage disadvantage kind of. I did, and then I f and then I found out about Shadow of the Demon Lord. Yeah, and there are way better versions of that mechanic. So, mm -hmm. but the the approach the approach that I'm considering go that I'm considering going with the um, Sword Saint is for one. Um, I know we talked. I know we talked about momentum when it came when it came to previous ones. I am not. I am not doing any doing any sort of um any any sort of any sort of moment any sort of um possibility to lose momentum kind of kind of approach. The the set the setup that I'm going that I'm going with is as you is um you you start you start out at as at, at at escalation zero. Um. The. Be at the at the first one, you choose one at the fir at the first escalation tier, and let's say we're can, let's say we're keeping the die and going all the way up to six. You pick one of the potential advantages that you have, and obviously going up the circles is going to give you more adv more um, advantages to pick from. Yep, bigger pool. Yeah. And um, so be so. Because so because because of that you're you're essentially you're essentially refining you're you're, you're refining your abilities passively, but you can bur but you can burn that pool to do a, to do a much stronger um, attack. So it's it's still sort of the count up of Cayenne, but. You get passive abilities as you're going up the chain, and then you choose your number and do big hit. Yeah, and the key the key of it is is that um, at the at the higher at the higher you go up, the more the more potential you have to tweak the um, the combination of passives that you get. Okay, I I like that. I like the rhythm of that a lot, and I like that you always have these interesting choices that you can choose between. Yeah. Um, because if I had done if I had done it straight if I had played the if I had played the um, escalation die set up straight, um, I think I think people would I think people would have just waited until they hit six and then go and then go uh, and then um, just just hit Nova. When one of the unintentional benefits of the escalation die was that it kind of um, kind kind of ca kind of caps the no the um, the no the whole idea of going Nova. Yeah, it really reduces or effectively eliminates the Alpha Strike problem, which is the whole the first there's this explosive and super important first round, and everything else is just kind of like putting the pieces back together and trudging towards the, the like pathetic whimpering end of the fight. Mm -hmm. Like I like that you get bigger booms every turn, and they're like they're bigger in a way that it's not. That it scales nicely, you know. I, I really and honestly, it's it's a little bit meta as the mechanic as it's presented in Thirteenth Age. But like accepting that, it's a really damn fine and damn fun addition to the way uh, RPG combat works. Oh, 
let's let's be honest here, uh, Joel. Half of the things that that happen in FF as skills are pretty meta in and of themselves. Oh, oh yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons that it marries so well with. I know. I know the escalation diet is good. For it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I really like Thirteenth Age. I really do. I love it. So. I don't know about perfect because I've never encountered anything perfect, but it's close. It's it's really good. Uh, it's and, really and honestly, good. Thirteenth Age is is the same design principles as Fourth Edition. So if you've played Thirteenth Age, you've played the better version of Fourth Edition. Mm-hmm. Oh well. Yeah. So you yay! Like fourth edition. It's it's great. It's really a good edition, and it got crapped on a lot. And I think the reason is because you're comparing it to every other D and D. But if you just like take it on its own merits, it's a great game. So. Small aside, Monk, just Mm -hmm. give me a chance to explain to Joel. Yeah, let's hear it. Okay, so uh, the reason I never got to play 4th was my friendly local game store had a group of grogs who were of the camp of people that you would hear about on the internet saying, 4th is just wow on paper. Healing surges are just potions. Um, That whole group and they would refuse to play anything but three five i'm like but guys can try something new and they're like i don't want to play an mmo on paper i'm like but but guys how do you know if mmo on paper if you haven't even read the book i didn't like that answer my friendly local game store start, started uh disinvolving me after that yeah it's not a popular opinion it certainly wasn't at the time um I mean, it's and the thing about it is, it's like it's not as though their arguments don't have some merit. It is weird that like a magical potion makes you do the thing you can apparently just kind of do whenever you want to do. There's a lot of meta in fourth, and you have to be comfortable with meta for it to work. But as if someone you who are likes comfortable medic. with meta, yeah, then you're gonna love it. Like there's because that's really the only of all the complaints against fourth edition. There are two that hold water. One is that it is meta, and you might not like that. And that's fine. But to some people, that kills the immersion, and I can't say that that's wrong, you know, because you have to accept meta to make fourth work. And the second one is it's not really D and D, and substantially, it really is not. It's very much its own game, uh, and the I've, setting of D and D does not mesh yep. well with it. I've so um, those are go ahead. I've I've do- I've dialed I've dialed myself away from the from the whole whether whether or not whether or not it counts as D- whether or not it counts as D and D for the for the simple reason that even the adherents can't seem to agree consistently on what counts. So I think that I think that there's some it's sort of like Final Fantasy in that regard. You um, know, there, there are some things that make something Final Fantasy, and if you stray too far away from that, it's no longer. And I'll grant they're they're pretty broad. Uh, but I, I still think you could say, like, like Dark Souls isn't Final Fantasy. You know, it has its own aesthetic. It's so aesthetically distant from Final Fantasy that, like, okay, that's not really very Final Fantasy. And, I'm, um, I, I've, you know, I've, at, even when I ask OSR people, I end up, I end up getting, I end up getting answers that don't, that don't match up. And if, and if it's that inconsistent, then I have no use for it. Um. But... I, I disagree, because you yourself made the assertion that Final Fantasy is a set of aesthetic principles, and you can make that same assertion with D and D. When it co- when it comes to when it comes to certain recurring recurring name when it comes to recurring names, yes. When it comes to uh, it com- n- names, magic systems like the the conceit of the crystals, uh, classes, and jobs, like. There's a lot, a lot, a lot yeah. that makes something a Final Fantasy, and you can exclude certain elements and include others that are discordant, mm-hmm. and still get something that's like recognizably Final Fantasy. It's broad, yeah. but like it's still made of those elements, and 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 fourth is like mechanically and and like stylistically distant enough from D and D that it really feels a lot more like a WoW kind of game, at least aesthetically. I, I've um. <sighs> When it comes when it comes to when it comes to the WoW comparison, I always I always found that to be to um to fall to fall to fall. Now I I do want to fall to fall kind of to call fall kind of flat because I couldn't help but notice that I st- that I started hearing that right around the time that WoW was ubiquitous. Um, it is pretty ubiquitous, but more than it being ubiquitous, the the way it looked 
became ubiquitous. The WoW orcs are orcs now. Orcs are very different before WoW came along. You know, uh, armor looked different before WoW came along. Like the the aesthetic of things is is enormously different post WoW because it was so influential aesthetically. If, if the the one the one the there's there are a couple critiques with Fourth that I do find a bit more legitimate. Um, one of them is that I do is that I do think they that the formula that was established with roles was um a, was a bit too, was a bit too um they had they had stuck to it a bit too a bit too hard for too long, and it wasn't until Player's Handbook three that they started tweaking with it. Mm. Um, yeah, it, that did eventually get better, and that's another kind of tragedy about fourth edition was that they did get to the point where they were fixing some really important things about it. Yeah, it's just at that point it lost like seventy to ninety percent of its audience, and it just wasn't sustainable anymore. The well, it, well, the other reason it wasn't is because they were running out. They were running out of ideas. More um, dragon. The entries in Dragon Magazine were just more and more themes. Um. But I'm but I'm get but I'm getting off I'm getting on the rails. The um the that co that covers the four classes, but there are there are a few tracks that are on the independent end of things. These are tracks that don't really count for it for um for for the um for the base four, but can be but can be shifted into. Um, it's the closest thing we have to mm -hmm. prestige classes. And even then, it's not really prestige classes. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is Astrologian, which I was Ooh, that sounds cool. I was tempted to in, to integrate that into Oracle, but in, but in hindsight, probably was for the, probably was for the best. Um, yeah, I feel like a name that rich deserves its own little thing. Yeah. They are they they are ba they are basically the they are the cl they are the classical astrologer draw drawing upon the drawing upon the patterns of the stars to to wield their magic, and in fourteen using a de going they are an RNG centric healer. Um, this might be a bit gimmicky, but I do th I do think that the astrologian. Should have a should have a motif kind of like a deck of cards. Okay. Um. Well, I mean that would be very much like the astrologian from fourteen. Yeah. Um. Now, if you if you don't want if you don't want to you if you don't want to use cards and you still want to use dice, just have it be a d just have it be a d four and a um let's say a d twelve. And a d fifty two. Um, but the the approach the approach that the approach that they have is, um, e is the I'd say each of the, each of these each of these suit each of these suits can provide a can provide a buff or a debuff depending on how they're used. It's essentially, you're essentially you're cast you're casting the ar you're casting the arcane or the or the reverse. Um, and I'd say I'd say in this regard, um, swords the or sorry not swords spades would probably would probably um would probably inc would probably increase attack de would probably increase physical attack damage, um, clubs would would um would pro would probably would probably mess with he would probably mess with health, but well, not clubs hearts would mess with health dime. Diamonds would prob would probably mess with um would probably mess with magic attacks, and clubs would probably mess with um crit with crit, and I'm I'm not a hundred percent set in stone with it, but the idea is that is that the the suit deter the suit determines the type of effect, whereas the value determines the strength of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you so most so most of your most of a um astrologian's turn would be would be dra would be drawing drawing a card from the deck. I act, I'd actually prefer a deck in this case, drawing a drawing a card in the in the deck, 
and then you and then spending their actions to you to use the, to use those effects. Um, whether they whether they use it in forward or reverse. Actually, you know what would be really cool with that. You know what would be cool with that is just let them draw more cards and hold more cards as um, they get more powerful. Yeah, that's actually what I was thinking of. It as they go through as they go through the cir the circles, they ha they have a higher um, hand. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of great, and, and I think this is revealing of me that maybe I just like a good gimmick. <laughs> like this, there's nothing super deep about draw a card and it tells you the kind of spell you can cast. But mm -hmm. honestly, I love it. You know, it's something that's neat and fun to do when you're sitting around the table with your friends. Like, like I said, rolling a d20 is fun once a turn. Pulling out a card, there's like a real sense of, ooh, what's it going to be? You know? I am so, I am considering putting one catch, though. If, when you when you use a card of a specific of a specific suit, if you have any if you have any cards of that same suit, those are at, those are added to that action. Hmm. Interesting. So, because because of that, you can, if you it, at higher tiers, you can you can have the option of of dumping all of dumping all of it into one type of effect, or you, or you can diversify it. Or if you do, or if you don't like, or if you don't like the cards, you can ju you can just there's, there's you can just kind of poker in it though. Yeah. So the hey, I like that. Honestly, it might even be neat to do kind of a Texas Hold'em thing where you read the stars whenever the the fight starts, and you just like have three cards dealt out in the middle, and then you just whatever cards you draw, you can make uh, hands with them, and that hand determines the kind of magic you can use. That might be way too complicated, but wow, yeah, that's, that's a fun idea. Um, now the next one is Chocobo Knight, which, um, largely because of the fact that even one, I thought, I thought the Jose Chocobo Knights in 10, I thought, I thought were awesome looking and the idea, uh, and the idea of, um, r of riding a Chocobo in the battle is something that isn't used enough. I agree. Like, I, I want Chocobo Cavalry, damn it. Yeah. And if they're good enough for Final Fantasy Tactics, then God damn it, they're good enough for us. Mm -hmm. And so the 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 big the big compare the big comparison that I have is the Lancer class from um, Fantasy Craft, which, despite it being called Lancer, it is basically for is basically for those who for it is basically the class for those who want to focus on mounted combat. And that's what the Chocobo Knight is. Some some other people may may fight from a mount, but a cho but the Chocobo Knight is for those who, um, for those who the mount and the and the rider are one and the same. It's always like when it comes to like mounted classes, it's always kind of a tricky preposition because like, you know, what what if the horse gets shot? What if it dies? You know, suddenly you have all these class skills that you just can't use because your horse is dead and you're just running around like, you know, my kingdom for a horse. Mm -hmm. So th there's an inherent risk to the design. But in the real world, having a horse, like, was just an advantage. Like, you didn't have a bunch of useless skills laying around that you traded other skills for like we do in uh, role-playing games. You just were, like, the same exact guy who was just as much of a kick-ass dude. But also you had, like, the height advantage and, like, the speed advantage with a horse. Like, horses just were fucking awesome. So it's, it's kind of hard to capture that exactly. Yeah. Um, it's my bedtime alone. Now, f fortun fortunately, the... The, um, ho the... Something like... Because of the system that we have here, if somebody's unhorsed, they're not going to be completely helpless. Oh. That's good. Yeah. Because I mean, like you're you're right. You're, you're gonna have at least two other tracks mm -hmm. that are supporting your "I'm good in a horse" power. Yeah. Um, next is Crown's Guard and Zan. I believe you had I believe you had something to say regarding this and another um track. Yes, we have two tracks from Final Fantasy 15 that were adapted into uh, which of the tabletop games was it? This was from D20. So. Crown's Guard and King's Glaive 
are they sound very specific to FF15 because they were two positions that people loyal to the crown of Lucis had regarding the powers they inherited from the crown. Crown Guard specifically had access to a sort of astral armory. They could summon their weapons from Starlight and send them back to Starlight, and they could do so as a sort of, I'm going to switch out my giant sword for a shield, or I'm going to switch out my gun for some machinery, or in the case of Prince Noctis himself, I'm just going to switch out for whatever weapon I fucking feel like. Hmm. Um, it's good to where, be king. <laughs> well, he is... It, thank you for quoting H.C. Bailey. Um, <laughs> uh, it's good to be the king is one of his many different uh, taglines during any game. Uh, the King's Glaive, specifically seen mostly in the King's Glaive movie, were different in the fact that they inherited the warp strike ability of the magic of Lucis. They could throw their weapon and move towards where their weapon went. Or if they threw their weapon with the intent to attack something, it would slam into the enemy and then they'd slam into it and do even more damage. Mm -hmm. Um... We've also come up with the uh, the idea, we, we discussed this in fact, what if someone wants to choose both Crown's Guard and King's Glaive to imitate being Noctis? Because Noctis has both powers. At that point, you would we, we came up with a, a pretty hefty restriction in fact. Mm -hmm. um, the first being that if someone chooses both Crown's Guard and King's Glaive, they cannot choose full buy-in to, as a feat to get a fourth track they have to re remain uh restricted to three tracks total and then the second being that while they don't have to take the noble track they do have to have a background that explains why they have the power of royalty mm -hmm. um now we also found a really good way to detach this from the specificity of final fantasy 15 and implant it anywhere the entire reason the kings of Lucis have the ability to have this magic is because they made a covenant with the Hexathian, the six gods, specifically through Bahamut and the Ring of the Lucii. Yep. In this case, you don't you can ignore the setting specific Hexathion, Ring of the Lucii, Crystal, everything else. It's just some kingly line made a covenant with a godly being, and the godly being gave their line powers. And that can be transplanted, transplanted into anything, whether it's medieval, whether it's futuristic, whether it's modern day. That can be transplanted everywhere. Mm -hmm. So those are those are the ideas we came up with when we came across Crown's Garden King's Glaive. I thought they'd be fun and interesting to add because maybe someone takes Fighter, who is already carrying around, you know, his his arsenal, and instead now his arsenal is all in astral light because he's Crown's Guard. Mm -hmm giving a little bit of a synergy effect there. Yeah. Or maybe somebody wants to have King's Glaive and they want to be able to get in close from wherever they are on the battlefield, um, such as a, a, a samurai, just going in and warping from person to person to build up his sen and smack them all down. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, really, it was really the combination of these two that we had to think of how to, A implement and b mitigate from becoming too overplayed and it ostensibly with four tracks if you had crowns guard We'd, king's glaive and two others you'd be unstoppable on the battlefield yeah we did we didn't want to have the jedi problem yeah, yeah. um now next is exorcist which is what which is an entry from bravely default Bravely Second, specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Exorcist is weird in the fact that it has the ability to revert battlefield conditions. Um, for example, it can undo a turn, so any damage you took, you no longer took. It seems kind of like a Cosmic Mage, except a little different, because it's not time. Time has still gone forward. It's just he undid what happened. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, their, their special ability...
going to do it. I mean, you're not. Let's, you're not entirely wrong. <laughs> you're not exciting. entirely I mean, wrong. I made this exact thing again uh, for Tian Chang because the the psychic guys can cancel at people's kung fu, so yeah. they basically have counter spell. Let me let me just give you an example of something in the actual tooltips for the Exorcist job. This is the level one ability called Undo HP. It costs 20 MP to use, and it says, revert the target's HP to its value at the beginning of the previous turn. Note that this can also revive the target from KO. That's amazing. So, oh. I mean, that's, that's a little OP for you know tabletop RPG in some cases. That might actually go higher because of the fact that, hey, my friend just got blasted into meat paste. Um... Undo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. My friend is no longer meat paste, or maybe you know, depending on the severity of the of the wound up to and including death, you just make it cost more MP. I actually love it when you think about tag teaming with like a blue mage character or someone. They're like, guess what I can do now? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really it's. Cool. It's a battlefield controller that specializes in undoing what has already been done on the battlefield. And the reason it didn't really fit in anywhere else was because that undo power doesn't really fit in anywhere yeah, else. It doesn't. Now, and I do, I do, th I do think we can keep, we can, we can keep that, we can keep that mostly to the point. It's just as you go higher in circles you get there's high, the um, pool of what you can cancel out increases um yeah good good design there i mm -hmm. think next is um guardian and another bravely second class yep i, I was i'm getting all the spotlight i'm sorry <laughs> and Man, uh, you're good in it though spotlight loves you uh it used to I'm not so uh, not so photogenic anymore. Regardless, well, the, um, the auditory spotlight. Don't don't let us ever see. It. <laughs> see, he knows me. He knows me well <laughs> enough. Um, so the Guardian, when it comes to Bravely Default, had two key things about it. One, as it took damage, it builds soul energy, in which it can do massive attacks. You know, th this is almost part and parcel a smaller form of limit break. Mm -hmm. Two, it could possess things, both enemies and friends. We have decided to eschew possession because that's just a can of worms we're not willing to uh, fuck around with right now. That's 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 a that's a that, big old can. That's a wall of text waiting to happen. Yeah, you're gonna get one of the one of the well actually people all on this if we go for possession mm -hmm. instead we decided to capitalize on the soul power aspect because there are some skills that the guardian has that allows them to instead of them taking damage they use a, an ability maybe called a... For three turns, you could erect a barrier that reflects all physical attacks uh, called soul.
mirror. Uh, you got an ability that did insane ass loads of powerful attack damage by by uh, using all soul power. You had to be at max too. Mm -hmm. So it was just 100% soul power, boom! Um, and you could also uh, use some of the soul powers to help boost a, uh, a target's defense or attack a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, now when it comes to how we'd, how we'd interpret the Guardian in this case, um, I, I, remember the d I remember someone making a Defender class in... Um, 13th age and that's what I'm going to use as a basis because of a because of one motif that it has the defend the defender can reduce the die size of it of its um attacks of its, of its of the damage that it does in order to, in order to get a boost to its AC the reason this is important is is they get a defender point for every die that ends up rolling a 1 and they spend those on the on so, on some of their on some of their offensive and some of their more powerful abilities. And given the and given the fact that the, that the guardian in this case is all, is all about util, utilizing de, utilizing defense in and um in this in this regard, I feel like this is a, I feel like that would be a way to Make it so. Make it so that bu that building up these defense-based abilities is not a, is not a passive affair. Yeah, you get to kind of be proactive with your defense. I mm -hmm. like that. Um. Now, then we get to a fun. Then we get to a fun one for me because I because I love the look and I love the weapon, gunbreakers. Ah. Uh. For, because because okay. somebody decided we need to put the gun blade in, in FF14. Eh, I like the gun blade. Mm -hmm. I know there's like a lot of uh, especially after uh, Noah Antweiler and the Spoonie one, like his epic rant on Final Fantasy VIII it being kind of like a, a dumb weapon comparable to the Shark Zooka. Uh, but I liked it. Uh, I liked that there was a little mini game where you had to hit R2. Mm -hmm. When you attach somebody, I like that in the Super Mario RPG. I liked it in Final Fantasy VIII. It, yeah, it's fine. And there are real life like equivalents of the gun blade. It's not like it's a ridiculous idea. It's just a more it, it's sophisticated bayonet kind of thing, and it's a little more swordy than it is gunny. But whatever. also, also bayonets have been used and have been used in Wild Arms since day one. I, I, yeah, I just I have to note, Joel, you uh, gave. Monk, the segue into a small reference to Spoonie on a silver platter. <laughs> look, I like all, these in look, all all I have to all I have to say is um is I've um I used to I used to hate him. Now it now I just now I just feel now I just have nothing but pity for the guy. That's all he all he wants. So um. Or rather, or rather, or rather, in another sense, now, now I just, now I just laugh at, at, at the, at the fact that, um, at, at every, at everything that ended up, ha everything that ended up happening, um, even though I do think he need, he needs some help, but I'm not sure if he has, if he's willing to set aside his ego. Um, well, he doesn't have the wherewithal for that, no. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the, when it comes to the um, gunbreaker, I think. W this the reason why we had to make this an independent is because no matter any way you slice it, the gunbreaker is intrinsically tied to having a gu having a gunblade equivalent as their custom weapon. It's no, there's no real way to get around that fact. So the so the the approach the approach to that I, that. I, that I'd want to go with when it comes when it comes to them is some is something of a something of a stylistic hybrid. They um they would prob they would probably they would probably be a would you would it be do you think it would be fair to say that they would be a combination of the of the custom ammo of say the gunner and the and the sword play motifs of the swordmaster. I, I, I suppose in a way, 
because not, not a direct lift from both of them, but ju but just in tr but a, just st a stylistic nod to them. Yeah, because the way Gunbreaker works in fourteen is the stances as we or the styles of the Swordmaster would be equivalent to the different shell types mm -hmm. that uh, that the Gunbreaker has to do different tanky things because it's a tank. Yeah, they made the Gunbreaker a tank of all things. Mm -hmm. oh. And yeah, I think I, yes, thematically they feel very similar to a, a small combination between different ammo types of gunner with the stance slash style types of a, of a sword master. Mm -hmm. um, because, because, because of there's, oh, there's, I would, I would, I would, I would say that the, that if, if you need to, if you need to utilize the trigger thing, um, I'd probably, I'd probably just have it that there's an extra effect every time they roll, um, evens. Yeah. Or something along those lines. Uh, starting to to incorporate even more mechanics from thirteen page flexible attacks. Oh. Well, we've, ar we've already we've already dipped. It's a brilliant system. I we've know. Already, we've already dipped into flexible attacks in one in one form. And this is this do this particular evens only is a bit is a bit more basic. It's just it's just you 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 use it. You fu you fu every time you roll an even you fu you fire one of you, you fire one of your shells. Um. I hey. love the fact that they named many of the uh, of the big boom attacks after uh, squalls um, squalls limit breaks. Mm -hmm. You have rough divide. You have you have faded circle. You have blasting zone. And the, the funny thing is, in both the PSP Dissidia's and the um, and the N and the NT Dissidia, squall is nothing to scoff at. He was an S rank character at the very least. My mm -hmm. Squall kicks ass. I I know that Final Fantasy VIII has a rocky relationship with Final Fantasy lovers, but like honestly, like Squall with a shit ton of ass. Yeah. What's what really always gets me about the rocky relationship with Final Fantasy members is that everybody takes the fact that Squall was for most of the game an emotional wall and implants that on cloud of all people like no cloud actually had quite a wide range of emotions for most of the game mm -hmm. yeah most, most of them suspect and like indicative of his really deep-seated damage and well well um both both cloud and squall have a degree of damage just in different forms it's just one of one of them is one of them is more psychological and the other one is literal yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of physical things going on with Cloud and his poor broken soul. Uh, oh. I, I don't know. I I really like Final Fantasy VIII for the exploration of, of trauma that it has. It's it's yeah. fascinating, and uh, I'm I'm glad you put the gun blade in this one. I mm -hmm. am. I think that was a good move. Yeah. Um. The and to be quite to be quite honest, I think I think it's too, I think it's um too I think it's too far removed of of a weapon to just to just make that into the equipment entry. Um, the the approach that the approach that I'd probably I'd probably go with when it comes to their custom ammo is each cust each um is that the bullets that they have are effectively temporary weapon tags that they can put on. All right. Because even the, even though the def, even though the default gun blade is the two hander, there's or, or rather the one the one or two hander depending on the depending on um, if you're talking about um, revolver or Hyperion, um, there's no reason that we have to stick to just those. And okay. What was your idea for a magic attack night? Um, <laughs> um, I would I would say that 
they are de they are definitely using some some sort of some sort of powered mount. There's no, the Magitek Knight is very blatantly taking all of its cues from the Magitek armor in FF6. Yeah, again, it's it's a presupposition that that equipment is going to be something you're going to deal with. But yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I don't think it's so ludicrous of an idea that people would want to have that, like, one of the most badass things in any Final Fantasy in their Final Fantasy. And if yeah. they don't, they can just admit the class. It's really, it's it's pretty modular. The the approach the approach that I'm considering when it comes to the Magitek Knight is they have they start out with a baseline design that's not too far removed. It would it would base it would essentially be the akin the akin of a of a um gu of a gun with legs essentially like ba like ba Babby's first standard array maybe so some some ma a basic melee attack a basic ranged attack and that's it. Um, as they in, as they go through the tracks, they have the they can customize it more and more. Um, maybe maybe and though, but when it comes to the when it comes to those customizations, it ta it takes a uh, it's a downtime activity to sw to swap those out at first. But as but I'd say a capstone is being is being able to being able to swap those out or do or do repair right in the middle of a battle. Because what I'm go what I'm going with with this kind of thing is a midway point between the Magitek armor that you see and power armor. In the sen in the sense right. of how in the sense of its customizability. So if some so if somebody doesn't want the doesn't want the bipedal approach that that we're familiar with. They want to they want to go tank treads or even make it so that their that their Magitek um is is more akin to a motorcycle go right ahead <laughs> and i think that uh, there is at least a, a statistically significant portion of the final fantasy fan base that wants that exact thing so mm -hmm. um the next one that i have is medic which i see met i see medic as a way to uh, to augment the he, the um abilities to to abilities to heal and remove debuffs i mean you already have you already are going to have some of that with um with white mage but if you want to double di if you want to double dip in that or just dip into it without specifically using spells like let's say somebody who who um is a is a decent fighter but also knows a bit of battlefield surgery Medic is the track that they'd pick. Alright. And and there's I don't think there's enough room for different varieties of uh healing anyway. Mm -hmm. I think it I think when it I th I think when it com when it comes to when it comes to medic in o in order to in order to balance it out, what I'd prop what I'd probably do is that the str the um the weaker one the weaker um, forms of healing that they can do can be used at any threshold. The stronger ones that they can do could only be used if the if the target is at half health or something. Hmm. I think you do. I think I think we lost. Uh... Zan's having um, technical issues. It's, it's hit all of us at this point. Poor guy. Yeah. Um, next one I have is merchant. Um, this is another this with merchant. I'm curious. Um, merchant is another one of those where the tr where the track abilities are gonna are are gonna lean a little bit little bit more outside of combat. Um, yeah, I, I see that. The mer the bi a lot of the a lot of the mer the merchant is go is go is going to be is going to be the um money boy. <laughs> For uh, obviously, but the the big the big thing about it is that they, is that they would is that they would be able to they would be able to um hold and hold and tr and transfer and transfer a lot of um a lot of stuff, um namely namely in the ter namely in terms of li of limited use items, um and po and. You can you can always you can always have the have the gag where one of their actions is 
is um, rolling is rolling on a table to pull something out of to pull something out of the proverbial bag of holding. I actually, if any class has a claim to fame on being able to just do bag of holding, uh, I think it's these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of like I would want to give them a power kind of similar to uh, the the horde hunter. I think it was what it's called from the the Dragonomicon book, which just makes any pocket or container they have something like a bag of holding and it can just fit way more stuff than it should yeah uh, it's a little gimmicky admittedly but honestly like it's almost like a track i would choose as a quirk for a character that already had two pretty solid tracks mm -hmm. so i i like it <laughs> yeah and i f i fig i figure ha we i figure having it having a few having a few tracks that are intentionally gimmicky is well Gimmicky tracks are are kind of the part and parcel of the of the independent track category. Yeah, that's that's the vibe I'm getting from it. Mm -hmm. um, next is mimic. <laughs> yeah, and that, that one is pretty self-explanatory, mm -hmm. I think. I do I do think that when it comes to mimic, they are they are not able to they are not able to copy enemy abilities. What the what they end what they end up do, what they end up doing is is tr is copy copy the abilities of their a of their allies in order to do an extra effect as long as, as long as it's an ability that they've seen they do get they do get a small host of abilities to keep um much much like with much like with the much like with the um, blue mage but i'd say i'd say that they have a they have a um they do have the they do have the a slightly a slightly wider um pool compared compared to compared to compared to the amount of slots that a blue mage has Sim simply be simply because of the fact that the abilities that they're going to be able to mimic from the party are they are going to be are going to become more consistent so it's so it's more of a matter of how, of how to of how to use the whole of the party to support the party yeah and it because it effectively gives you another of one of the other party members at the most critical moment that you need them mm -hmm. at its best, uh, and at worst, it's just plainly redundant. Yeah. So uh, honestly, I I really like that situationally it sort of winds up balancing itself. Mm -hmm. So what did I miss? We just uh, finished. We just finished. We we um went through Magitech Knight, <laughs> Medic, and Merchant. And we just um, finished, we're into mimic mm -hmm. now. Okay, so you discussed merchant as it comes from bravely default then. The approach the approach that I end up doing with with merchant is give is giving them is giving them the ability to pull a to pull a random thing out of a bag of holding, which is a bit gimmicky, admittedly, and yeah, and the and having better having better chances to haggle for buying and selling things. Mm-hmm. No, uh, sorry about that, guys. Apparently, my router decided to just fuck itself, and uh, I had to perform some emergency surgery on stuff. Oh, the the greatness of being a network engineer and doing your job off on your off time. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's continue. I, I I need to feel better. Yes, not worse. So next is Puppet Master. So this is an interesting one. Because Puppet Master, as far as I'm aware, has only ever appeared in Final Fantasy XI. Mm-hmm. And... It's... Uh, the Puppet Master was essentially what they were going to do for Necromancer in FF11, but then said, eh, Necromancer doesn't really fit our setting. And the puppets... Uh, are essentially a dual team they have the automaton that fills a separate role and they can go in and uh they can go in and, and do things that the puppet master is not doing while they're dpsing or they can both dps for some heavy damage i feel i feel like when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the um now the the puppet master I do think is going to be one of those gimmicky classes. The first thing that they that they build is a 
is a automaton who basically basically is their um their Gemini. Um, the key thing is that th that this automaton, unlike unlike some of the other pets, this the approach that I'm going with this is that they are essentially an NPC that has one track from one class track. I should note they do not have access to any of the independent tracks. Just one cl one particular um class track. I, I was going to think more along the lines of a puppet master could swap out tracks that their automaton can use based on their own tracks. Ooh. I actually like that better. Like, it's that's, a, that's pretty sexy. It's a let's say a pup. Oh, sorry. I'd say that's, I'd say that's going to be a little bit more balanced than what I was going with. Well, so, so for example, what you do is you take a, like you give you give the puppet master one track from any of the four core classes because it yeah. has to have its own track to be able to swap stuff around. Yeah. But then let's say you have a puppet master who's taken uh, paladin and black mage, and you've given the puppet itself, I don't know, ninja. You could then. At that point, because the Puppet Master track always has to remain on the Puppet Master for him to control the puppet, mm -hmm. you could then say, I don't really like casting magic as a Puppet Master. Hey, Puppet, now you have Black Mage and I have Ninja. The, the, puppet, uh, the puppet would uh, increase its track, uh, the, its own track, the, very, the, the one track you give it. I would say at the same rate as a middle track, so that we have that it's not too fast, but it's also not too slow to keep that way. Whatever track you swap out with the uh, with the puppet, it's it's tra its track progress is based on its middle track speed. So you could also um, just completely disassociate one of your tracks into an independent creatly automata with its own hit points and action pool. That way, you're less effective. As an individual, but your your automata gets to do stuff independently of you, and then you could switch out and have modular tracks that way too. Um, the approach the approach that I'm cons that I'm considering so that so that it doesn't get too out of hand is as the as is the um the pu the um the puppet ma the circles on the puppet master track are the effective cap for whatever tr for whatever track it has. How okay. However, um, as a as a downtime activity, as long as long as you have the proper resources, you can you can swap you can swap it out, you can swap that track out with um, GM approval. Well, the the reason I'm talking about only switching out the track with tracks you know mm -hmm. is because very commonly in in FF11, uh, when you would change the role for your puppet, you'd be doing it with your with. Uh, a class you're already familiar with, or maybe your own subclass, because uh, FF11 had a class subclass system, mm -hmm. in order to augment what you were already doing. So that's why I was like, you have Puppet Master and two others, and it gets its own base track. And so you use the Puppet Master track to determine its, ra its rate of track. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would take its track, and it would take the track from you. Anytime you have downtime out of combat because you couldn't switch the the role of your puppet in the middle of battle in the game either no um the the big th i'd i'd say i'd say what the reason i was hesitant at first cuz you meant you mentioned you mentioned it specifically being rooted in the medium um um tra um track and i think i think i think that might be a little t i think that's a little res on the restrictive end of things Especially so just scale it with the puppet ma scale whatever track is implanted in it with whatever the puppet master has as puppet master. Yeah, that makes more sense um, because the automaton was entirely dependent on the uh, puppet master's uh, skill levels in the game. So that definitely, I, again, I know we're we're pulling a lot of inspiration, but I think the idea of uh, of having tracks that you can swap in and out with your puppet, both so that you and your puppet are an effective team, mm -hmm. makes sense. 
Um, I don't really like the idea of re reducing what you have uh, permanently, simply because the three track system is fairly well balanced on its own, and yeah, full buy in allows you a uh, fourth track. Maybe we would also add a restriction to Puppet Master that they can't use full buy-in since they're already technically getting a free track for their automaton. A possibility is a possibility to to help make sure that that doesn't happen is um, the idea that th that they can that they can only hang on. Seem to be having a bug problem again. Ugh. Still, it's uh, not like uh, not like I have another Firefly in here, so we'll, we'll be good. Yeah. Um, no the the idea that I'm the the idea to help balance that out that I'm thinking is in the form of action economy, i.e., they have to get they have to give um they have they have to give their action to their automaton in order for it to act. Otherwise, it can only do reactions. Reactions and move actions, mm -hmm. so that it can at least maneuver. Yeah. I still think you could use that for stuff, because there's a lot of powers that like let you charge up and you get your ass kicked. So just putting that in the right place and letting it take a beating for you could be really useful. It could be, but that's also slightly situational at that point, depending on what tracks you've picked. Mm -hmm. If I, if we I, assume... I yeah, if we assume that everyone's going to min max, then we'd have to do a lot more tweaking on everybody on every on every part of this. But we we all three of us know that in the vast grand scheme of t uh, of TTRPGs, most people do not min max. Mm -hmm. Even if they do, like that tends to be something that. Cause think about it: if you have one person paradigmatically that is min maxing and no one else's, the net benefit is still to the party. Because yes. they just have a more powerful friend that's useful to have. You know? It doesn't have to be bad to min-max. Oh, so, I, I, mean, I, if we, if we I accept know. it as an inevitable consequence of some people min-maxing and that not really being an issue for the game unless we're talking about it eating more time or attention and taking that away from the game. like Because there are destructive ways you can min-max. But if, like, if we assume that, that it is min-maxing towards the benefit of the group, then there's really no issue with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's ultimately my 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 point is that sure, there's a situation in which you could take Guardian and put it on put it on the puppet <laughs> and have it build soul power and then shoot cannons. But what you're essentially doing then is you are sacrificing the durability of your automaton uh, to become a glass cannon, a, a glass cannon charged by damage. I might. Have. Uh, your automaton will eventually go down, and I don't think. In fact, I'm I'm 100 percent sure the automatons could not take pure magic in a in FF11 because they're not alive. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, there'd have to be some specialized fix action from the puppeteer. Yeah, I'm going to name my puppet Pinocchio. You know what? That is perfectly fine. I'm pretty sure there are people who did that in FF11. In and, fact, and I my, think my my guy will be named Geppetto. Love him. Oh, screw uh, screw off! I know you. I know as well. I know you're gonna <laughs> name you're gonna name him Frankenstein. <laughs> and you're gonna and you're gonna name your you're gonna name your puppeteer Froderick. Froderick Frankenstein. I thought it. Uh, I thought it was Frankenstein. Well, it's no, not it's Frankenstein. Frankenstein. No, no, it's Frankenstein. Come along, Igor. You must be Igor. Igor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are three of us, and all of us are like we we have this memorized. You're not letting us do the other half of the bit. You have no <laughs> faith in us, Anne. You're like, no. Have you listened to you for the last two hours? Of course, I don't have any faith in you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, it's if only that weren't that were uh, actually true. I have much faith in the both of you. Outstanding. Oh god, I don't have a lot of faith in my ability to stay awake much longer though. How close are we to finishing this up? This Spirit is the Master last is this is the last here. one. Spirit Master. Oh, yeah. Spirit Master nice. is where I get to spotlight again because Good it's a, a bravely default class. I'll take a nap while you do that. 
Oh yeah, Make sure. Fresh for the finale. Spirit <laughs> Spirit Master is a class in Bravely Default that uh, works as a solely uh, party buffer, and the way they buffed in Bravely Default was to increase resistances to elements and status effects, and also they had a really useful skill that I used to break the game utterly um, that just prevented all damage from and to all sources for a small number of turns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you could manipulate speed economy, which I could, you could always ensure your Spirit Master would act last in your party lineup, but always first before any enemy. And so you did all your damage. And then they cast Stillness. And you're just like, ha ha ha, you can't hurt me for two turns. But in, in this case, with the uh, TTRPG side, I still thought the whole on, this is somebody who manipulates resistances just on the party. It is, it's, it's not going to do anything to the enemies, because I don't think we were going to implement stillness. That's just mm -hmm. broken. <laughs> but things like Fairy Ward, which increase your resistance to, to all elements for a turn, and only to like 25%, but uh, that, that was the idea, the general idea I had behind Spirit Master. Uh, at this point, I will let Mildred take it away with the more specific yeah. things he came up with. Um, so when it when it comes now, obviously being a um, being a being a but being a pure buffer in the in this regard is not, is not ide is not exactly ideal. Um, for the same reason I didn't put synergist in. So give, given given that. The the approach the the approach that I'm that I'm that I'm that I'm considering is that is that they are able to manipulate the buffs and deep, the status effects of of the environment. So they're they're not the they're not the they're not the type that would get that would get rid of um, poison. What they would do is shift is shift poison over to somebody else. Hmm. Continue. Um. And some something something and within that something else I had con I had considered is that th is that there is that some of their offense some of their offensive abilities are more are more potent the mo the more status effects that they that they take upon themselves. So they could they could st they could st they could st they could st um, hoard a fair a fair amount of positive and negative status effects in order to boost themselves. But on the downside, you're taking you're taking a bunch of stuff that's probably going to screw you over if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. But maybe you also put on white mage for that reason, so you can cast a Suna later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is Suna get out of jail free card. One of the things that elevates this idea to me a lot, because I do like that. I, again, the mechanical novelty of that is enough that it is a passing grade for me. But again, looking at a track based system where you're choosing three tracks, the combinations of that with other things really ignites my creativity. You know, it's it's anytime you have mechanical novelty like that, it, it's it's wonderful to stack with other abilities. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I really like that. Yeah. And that's really the point. Uh, you know, even if it's not the highest level of mechanical novelty, such as Fighter or Squire, as you said, in combination with the other things around you, you have an amazing gamut of classes or class tracks to play around with in a way that you're like, I... like. Let's go through my uh, my fun little naming schemes again. Let's say, I I'm a puppet master whose puppet is a sword saint, but I'm also a summoner and a mediator. Mm -hmm. You can yeah, throw... It's, really, it's all kind of reminiscent of the uh, the Iron Kingdoms RPG, the, the recent one that they made, where you have to choose from two very mechanically and thematically distinct classes. 
I'm really getting like very good comparative flashbacks to that one. So. Well, then I guess we've done our job, haven't we, Monk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this, yep. is, this is impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, Ooh, I think oh, that's about all for me, though. Ooh. Um, a so fine. A fine. A. A, um, f a final thing I wanted to ask is a bit of a question. I know we mentioned that we're going to be doing MP, but should we br should we bring in um, should we bring in tech points as well, or just stri just keep it strictly to HP and MP? By tech points, I assume you mean the points that were used for normal attacks in the MMOs. Yeah. No. Yeah, I can, those were I... removed from the MMO for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, I can I kind of fi I kind of figured as such. Um, I know I know that 14 has TP in the in, when it comes to weapon skills and the like, but not anymore. That was removed in Stormblood. That was the one good thing I thought that that one good change I thought they made when they were simplifying everything. All right, for, it's that's a that's a fair point. And when it comes to res when it comes to resources for specific tracks, those can those that can be that can be put in that can be put in as an as, as a aside on the sheet. Um, yeah. There's are there's already a few tracks in there's already a few tracks like Iron Mage and Legend that do that anyways. Yeah, and then of course we've we've already considered some uh, resources specific to a track such as again Sen and Kenki in Samurai or uh, anything else of that nature. So. While MP is more ubiquitous because you have a lot of classes that use something magical, um, most classes are going to have some sort of resource management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like we've kind of baked that into a lot of the different non-magical classes. So, yeah, I don't think codifying it really benefits it because, the, again, the novelty is part of the appeal. Exactly. Now, when... Now, um... With that, with that said, I think I think that'll more I think that'll more or less cover it. I'll pr whether or not I will probably end up I'll probably end up writing the tr the tracks myself as well as as well as submit these two little videos to the Hedra group. But that I think is that I think is going to do it for this particular episode of Geek Watch. Next time we will delve into Vidya in a more traditional format instead of us theory crafting. It'll just be us bullshitting. You know, standard so things. Appealing. The standard, the standard get a, get around around here. Yeah. yeah. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs> <laughs>